Hi Dato. Hi morning. Can you hear me? Hi morning. Good 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 morning. How are you? How is yeah. everyone today? On this fine and wonderful uh, Monday, Monday morning. morning. Yeah. You've got a lovely, relaxing backdrop. <laughs> that's right. That's right. To remind us what it's all about. <laughs> Very good. So I'm just working, man. Are you going to be the MC to to? Uh, no, Amelia is the MC for today. Okay. Yes, I'm the MC. Hi. Yeah. Okay. And Faizin will uh, the whole session with the Doa recital. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. And how many people do we have logged on already? Ah, okay. Never mind. Early. Early. People will drop in. So I think by the time I finish, we'll have uh, enough people. Uh, enough people. <laughs> be full in. But it's fine. It's very good. It's very good. Is Dr. Dominic joining us this morning? I'm sure he is. I'm not sure. What yeah. I'm, I'm not sure where. Yeah. Probably, he's not. He's not on this. He'll be on the uh, what? The general call. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that Sharon, this is uh, increasingly a, a, a topic of note within your sort of deliberations with your shareholder. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I think mm. ESG is here to stay, very much here to stay. Mm. I think, mm. uh, and uh, no. yeah, really, there's no choice but to start looking at it. Yeah. So yes, we do. We do, and we're all coming up with our own, uh, you know, full-fledged yes. ESG policy as well. Yes. Which yes. I don't think I mentioned in my speech. I mentioned in my speech. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> It's uh, 9 a.m. Shall we start? Um, yeah. The... Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So, I'll go and see me. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, Amelia, take it away. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, ESG and New Beyond Investing, brought to you by MIDF Amala Asset Management Berhad and MIDF Research. I'm Amalia Zaria and I will be your MC for today. Before we start, let me give you an overview of the agenda. This webinar is a two-day program where we will help um, distinguished speakers and panelists covering informative topics, including an overview of the development of ESG framework in Malaysia and how do we rate ESG level of companies and how far Malaysian companies have embraced the ESG agenda. This webinar will not only provide technical details of investing in ESG, but also on how the audience can contribute towards the ESG agenda. We hope you will find a program that we have lined up for you to be fruitful. Just a reminder that you may type in your questions in the chat box and I will bring them up at the end of the segment if we have time. To begin the session, I would now like to invite Encik Faizin Muhammad Shamsuddin to lead the Do'a recital. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, uh, moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. We begin our program today with the recitation of Umul Kitab Al-Fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن رحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اشرح لنا صدورنا ويسر لنا أمورنا وحل الأبطة من ألسنتنا يفقه وقولنا يا الله يا رحمن الرحيم الحمد لله for everything in this ESD webinar we are gathered here to seek your countless bounties and blessings يا ذا الجلال والإكرام we pray to you to make this webinar a good blessed and successful program 
we ask you to grant us as much as knowledge as possible throughout this webinar. We seek you to grant us the knowledge of this world for the good of our world to be a better place for its people. Ya Allah, the most merciful of all, please always guide us to mercy. Please guide us to a straight path in our work and life affairs for happiness in the world and hereafter. Ya Allah, we seek for our country Malaysia for the safety, prosperity, peace and blessings of the beloved nation and its people to be prosperous and successful. Allahumma yassir wa la tu'assir, Allahumma tamim bi khair. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin. Rabbana alayka tawakalna wa ilayka anabna wa ilayka al-masir. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanah wa fi al-akhirati hasanah wa qina adhab al-nar. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alam. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Faisal. Okay, without further ado, let's continue with our welcome note by MIDF's Group Managing Director, Dr. Sharon Wardini Mokzani. I will hand it over to you, Dato. Thank you, Emilia. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good morning to everyone. And thank you so much for making time to be here at you know, uh, our webinar on ESG and you uh, beyond investing. I mean, as all of you know, um, you know investing well, it's primarily about finance and making financial returns. But ESG reminds us that it's, not everything is about money. And uh, that, you know, when we look at investing, we should also put alongside our financial considerations, um, ESG considerations, environmental, social and governance. And I hope that the webinar over this morning and tomorrow's morning will, will, will help us, you know, flesh out these issues, understand what it's all about and, and uh, make us think a bit more. We have uh, an excellent, excellent panel of of speakers to take us through uh, this morning and, and, and tomorrow morning. So, you know, I'm, I'm borrowing the CFA Institute's uh, some uh, definitions of environmental, social and governance. There are many definitions, but I think it's pretty clear to all of us um, what this means. Unfortunately for Malaysia, uh, we don't do very well in ESG as a whole. If you look at our, at our economy, our major exports are oil and gas, which clearly from a carbon point of view is not very environmental palm oil, which again, from an environmental point of view, is seen as something which leads to less biodiversity, um, chopping down of forests and, and, and air water pollution, which again is not environmental. We have tourism, which appears to be environmental, especially with the drive for ecotourism. But you know, for tourists to get here, it means they have to fly on jets and burn lots of fuel and add to more carbon in the atmosphere. So again, not the most environmental friendly of, of, of exports. And even in the manufacture of e and &E, um, we do find some issues with, uh, with the, in, in terms of the the, um, uh, the raw materials involved, and of course the power consumption for me, which which comes you know predominantly from from fossil fuels, generates predominantly from fossil fuels. On the social side, um, again, we our country has does not have the greatest reputation. Um, we've had our goods stopped at the U.S. borders because of the way we, we treat our workers, and we've some, seen some horrendous photographs of migrant workers herded onto lorries and taken away to be hidden away from the authorities because the employers would rather hide them and, and, and not have them tested positive for COVID rather than have the factories closed down, which is, which is a terrible indictment of our, of our society and what we, we put first. And of course, on governance as well. I mean, um, recently, uh, Indonesia launched a sovereign wealth fund. And the one thing they said was that we want to have good governance, unlike Malaysia. So it's not, not the greatest record, but you know, one thing we have seen from this pandemic, which has been terrible for lives and livelihoods and social intercourse, in the sense that you know we no longer are able to talk to people face to face. I am talking to you right now, not to you, but I'm looking at a piece of glass, which is my computer screen. So I'm talking to a piece of glass. People walking past me, I'm mad talking to a piece of glass. But this is where we've come to. We have come to a situation where the pandemic has made us all stay at home and talk to pieces of glass as a replacement to talking to each other. But you know, one good thing, well, not so a good thing, but one thing the pandemic has taught us is that it is possible to change. Um, with the lockdown, um, I suddenly hear birdsong again. I see butterflies and uh, clear skies in KL. I've never seen them. I know it's been forever. I, I couldn't remember what clear skies in KL looked like. Suddenly now uh, we see them. Some of you may and subscribe to Apple TV, where David Attenborough's film called The Year of the Earth Change um, shows just what a tremendous effect uh, uh, just one year of lockdown has had on, 
on the environment. So one thing the pandemic teaches us is that things can change for the worse very, very quickly, but also things can change for the better very, very quickly. So it's not too late. It is never too late to do something about the environment, to do something about society, and to do something about governance. Um, so for example, um, one of the one of the factoids that have been given is that daily global carbon emissions in early April uh, 2020 fell by 17%. And this is really the biggest drop in carbon emissions since uh, uh, World War II. And World War II was when everybody was killing each other. So you know, things have, have changed and they can change um, very different. And of course, from a society point of view, we've seen people helping each other. And even from a governance point of view, um, at the very least, um, because of, uh, as, you know, as, ri as rising tides uh, lower, uh, raise all boats, uh, when the tide goes out, and, and as Warren Buffett says, you can see who's, who's still swimming in the underwear. Um, it's also pandemic has also uh, uh, showed us uh, some governance failures and, and things which we can can do better and, 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 and should do better. But one thing is for certain, ESG, which we've always talked about, suddenly really is at the forefront of the of our agenda. I was talking to Mr. Ramesh before we started just now, and he asked me about you know what how we see um, ESG. And, and it's how we get MIDF, ESG. And it's true, it is at the forefront. Once upon a time, it was seen as a fringe thing, something you know, but more akin to hugging trees. But now it really is the forefront, we know. That we can't just look at financial returns, we have to look at ESG returns. So we have embraced this journey uh, here at MIDF. We'll be launching our own internal um, environment green policy, make sure that we, which cuts it. We start from everything from the type of businesses we work with, the money, uh, who we lend money to, to our own uh, carbon footprint. And, and, and we're hoping to launch that. Um, very short, we will be launching that very shortly. And of course, we held a, a green conference, one of the first banks to hold a green conference when people weren't even, weren't even uh, with still a nascent subject. This was two years ago. And uh, we also uh, provide um, green financing, both on, through our government funds as well as through sponsoring um, uh, green projects, particularly in, in re renewable energy. And, you know, Malaysia really is poised for more ESG investing. We do have a lot. Now, regardless of what I said earlier to open this, this this conference, there are lots of exciting ESG projects which we can invest in, in Malaysia. And this stretch from renewable energy all the way to to and, 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 you know, renewable energy and, 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 and everywhere else in terms of how to do it right. So I think the time is right to do it. Globally, of course, um, um, ESG investments uh, amount to almost 1.7 trillion US dollars, which is an enormous amount of money, but it's still only 6.7% of total global uh, um, AUM. So there is room for growth. And I think there is room for growth, particularly in Malaysia. And in the next two days, we will be listening to many distinguishers talk about this. Uh, after me, we have Mr. Ramesh Khanna, chairperson of the Malaysia and Brunei chapter of the United Nations Global Compact, who will speak about Malaysia's ESG development and how corporate leaders are committed to implement universal sustainability principles and to take steps to support UN goals. We have representatives from uh, many some local companies who have developed and embraced the ESG framework, who will talk on the need to adopt ESG and which have evolved from being good to have um, to need to have. And, and these companies are have high ESG ratings and will form one of the basket of companies which we can in our new ESG fund will invest in. But more from that from my colleagues from MIDF Asset Management, Burhat, and what our new ESG funds are about. And of course, we'll have panel, uh, panel discussions on, on ESG investing in practice. And another one today and the other one tomorrow and how, you know, how uh, ESG ratings works and how corporates ra are rated from an ESG point, point of view. We've also invited Seed Malaysia, an NGO that fully embraces ESG through volunteer work, including educating, practicing, sustainable living. And we hope that, you know, by the end of this webinar, you'll understand a bit more about, about what ESG investing is. And not only that, what opportunities there are to do ESG investing in Malaysia. You don't have to buy a global fund investing all over the world in ESG. You can e invest in ESG in Malaysia and make you know, our country a, a better place. At the same time, making financial returns too, because one thing is certain is that more and more investment is going to come in, into ESG. So the earlier you get onto the ESG um, uh, train, uh, the better. Now, before I end, I just want to express my sincerest gratitude to our distinguished speakers for their time and willingness to share their knowledge with all of us and who are here and all of you who are here for this webinar. I sincerely hope all of you will enjoy today and tomorrow's sessions and I thank you for your participation and support. It is my ardent hope 
that we will all be able to have more of these types of discussions and sessions soon. Wabilahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. So thank you very much and have a wonderful conference. Thank you and back to you, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tato, for the opening remarks. Now, for the first segment of today's webinar, I would like to welcome our first guest speaker, Mr. Ramesh Khanna, who is the chairperson of the United Nations Global Compact for Malaysia and Brunei. Mr. Ramesh will be sharing his insights on the overview of the ESG framework in Malaysia. The floor is yours, Mr. Ramesh. Thank you, Amalia. And thank you, Dr. Sharon. And as always, a very engaging speaker. And, and I think he's engaging because he speaks from the heart. And I'm going to come back to that theme a little bit later in this conversation. So thank you, Dr. Sharon, for such a fantastic welcome to this webinar. Uh, so a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, making the effort to participate this morning. And thank you to MIDF for both taking a lead within the banking sector in Malaysia, as well as actively collaborating with UNGC in raising the level of awareness in the uh, ESG space. I say that because I personally have had several interactions with, with several uh, uh, members of your, your leadership team over many, many months in discussing various uh, aspects of ESG and sustainability and, and uh, the SDG ambitions. And it, it is very engaging and it's very real. Uh, and we thank you. Uh, we thank you for that. Um, I will start off by discussing the ESG landscape in Malaysia from a UNGC perspective, uh, what it looks like to us and where we see, see some very specific risks and by implication opportunities. So let me start off by saying uh, something that's really dear to my heart in that I find the term ESG uh, or ESG in Malaysia in its own right somewhat restrictive in framing a conversation. Um, there is a hard edge about, uh, about the term ESG that does not reflect the human side of what we're really on about, whether it's pre-COVID, post-COVID, whether it's Malaysia or the rest of the world. And Dr. Charon, you actually hit on that uh, a few minutes ago. Um, let me instead use the term uh, ESG consciousness. And I, it's a term that I, I personally really like because it allows us not to have to look for labels labels for really good things that companies and people and governments and a myriad of other stakeholders in Malaysia and other countries are doing. So a few things we need to really keep in mind as we try to wrap our heads around this whole ESG thing. Right? Number one, ESG consciousness comes from within. It comes from within. It's those little things that you can do like turning off your your light switch before you, you, you leave home to go to work. In the days when we used to be able to get on a get in a car or a bus and go to work, right? These are little things that contribute towards the, you know, perhaps the E uh, of the ESG. It's the winning of hearts and minds and the transformative impact that has on organizations. It's the lubricant that allows for the sustainable development goals, the ambitions to become real and engaging across multiple stakeholders. So ladies and gentlemen, ESG consciousness is a place it's not a phase. Right. Now, on that note, let me talk about the landscape in Malaysia. As with investors and um, uh, shareholders uh, elsewhere, Malaysian investors similarly are increasingly expecting greater transparency and accountability from the investing companies as they take greater interest in the social and environmental uh, impact of their investment decisions. ESG investing is still more prevalent in Europe and the US, but given the global nature of investing, it has also impacted Asian companies, Malaysia included. In Malaysia, it's projected that in the next five years through to, let's say, 2025, the market for ESG projects, related projects, will require financing of approximately 45 billion ringgit. All right, that's a lot of money to be spent over the next five years if if uh, you know, we truly are to, to finance what's in the, in the pipeline and what we see coming through the pipeline. And due to this enormous funding requirement, public sector financing alone will be insufficient given the strain that will impose on um, public finances. As such, the deployment of private sector investments through the capital market will be critical in financing these sustainable development needs. This, ladies and gentlemen, represents opportunities. While the trend is still nascent here, interest levels in creating a pool of um, ESG capital as well as ESG-related projects 
addressing the sustainable needs of the country has grown exponentially and not surprisingly accelerated by regulator regulator support the malaysian government has facilitated creation of what ungc calls a framework of support and we see this as a very positive development certainly moving the country in the right direction we can never get it perfect and we're not looking for perfection personally as chairman of gc and i know i speak for my leadership team we're looking for incremental change right because incremental change means there is change there is an improvement to go from zero to a hundred i believe is a bit unrealistic uh, it's not only about money it's the infrastructure and largely mindset culture right? so incremental change is what i'm uh, i'm on about so if i go back to this framework of support we can look at we don't have to look very far behind look at the the recent government uh, malaysian government budget the government aims to create a sustainable financial hub the first sustainability bond in malaysia for environmental and social initiatives will be issued in uh, this year um, the government announced that it will also continue the green technology financing scheme 3.0 with a fund size of about 2 billion uh, ringgit for two years uh, through to the end of next year and this will encourage the issuance of uh, sustainable and responsible investment suku can encourage private sector to uh, participate in green technology um, just a couple more things the plans to reverse environmental degradation very very key there's approximately 600 million ringgit worth of funds for forest forest plantation and, and uh, reforestation uh, to hit that 50 percent forest cover protection uh, metrics uh, and impactful high value farming projects again moving in the right direction uh, plans to transition the country to low carbon energy sources uh, again supported by the drafting of a natural gas roadmap as part of the nat uh, national energy policy will be announced um, so uh, shortly and and the last one further encouraging the issuance of sustainable and responsible investment products and bonds uh, to achieve yes we spoke earlier green social uh, sustainable standards through a series of tax incentives valid for the next five years so high level policy level moving in the right direction uh, and that's a great start so let me address UNGC's perspective of some of the key risks and as I said earlier conversely opportunities in Malaysia climate risk factors feature really really predominantly in in our uh, conversation rising temperatures rising sea levels in Malaysian waters extreme weather conditions the coastal areas around Malaysia will gradually face the risk of being submerged with receding uh, coastlines now all of this will lead to issues of food security uh, food production, volatility of prices, and of course we'll have damaged assets and compromised infrastructure. Very, very big area. Let me give you a st <coughs> staggering statistic. We estimate approximately 10.3% of total assets held by banks in Malaysia is potentially exposed to climate change risk. That is a staggering uh, amount. Uh, and it's something we really need to, to pause and reflect on. And I'll tell you the uh, sectors with the highest exposures are construction, transportation, agriculture, and utilities. Malaysia still lags other countries when it comes to investing in developments that mitigate climate change. So we need to be focused on that. The other area is around waste management. We see this as a significant both risk and opportunity area. The separation of waste and processing is not yet prevalent. <clears throat> the waste we typically find in Malaysia, as with a lot of other uh, Southeast Asian countries or Asian countries, has a high calorific content. That means there's a lot of plastic that we throw out. You know, your your tetare in a plastic bag, that plastic bag gets thrown out into the bin. They have high calorific content. Um, and it does lend itself to great waste to energy projects. But the sorting of the waste and the high moisture content is still an issue. And that's where the economics then start to go the wrong way so there's a big uh, it's a risk uh, it's also a really great opportunity if one were to invest in that sort of uh, sorting infrastructure right? we definitely fall behind other countries when it comes to penetration of renewable energy electric vehicle sales uh, construction of green buildings um, uh, we have uh, in malaysia renewable energy penetration uh, i'm quoting some numbers from two years ago so about six percent compared to uh, the global benchmark of about 28%. Thailand's at about 12%. Even Indonesia's at about uh, 9%. All right. Green vehicle sales, 2.2%. Electric vehicles in the country compared to Europe of 75 the UK of almost close to 10 
So some way to go. And then, of course, green buildings, which is now uh, uh, something we, we talk about and we advise a lot of our GC, uh, UNGC members, less than 1% of stock in Malaysia. Uh, whereas even in Singapore, they're getting up to, to 40%. So big, big opportunities there. Every one of these risks represents opportunities for government and industry. How are we responding and why? <clears throat> one of the main thrusts uh, for ESG adoption in Malaysia, clearly not the only one, is due to the growing pressure from global investors, as I've uh, mentioned earlier. Um, I think all of you will be familiar with the actions of uh, BlackRock, who wrote to, I think it was 577 companies in Asia Pacific, which represented about 90% of the MSCI index. Uh, excluding Japan and Australia, articulating the expectations for greater sustainability disclosures from them. Malaysian pension funds have been active in pursuing ESG investing. Uh, locally, uh, institutional funds such as KWAP and EPF have been really instrumental in creating awareness of their ESG expectations amongst analysts, fund managers, and public listed companies. And if I have one criticism, and I'll put it on the table, if I have one criticism here is that we have Malaysian institutions, whether it's KWAP, EPF, Kazana, PNB, they're actually doing some really, really good things, but they don't get the, the airtime. It's not publicized enough in this country, but they're doing, in a lot of cases, as much as their counterparts in other countries, but, they, but, but we don't seem to want to talk and celebrate uh, these things. And, and, and so, again, it's something that we'd like to see some, uh, some change in. Um, uh, EPF, uh, Malaysia's largest pension fund, recently advised that it wants brokerage firms in Malaysia to incorporate ESG considerations into their research process alongside traditional financial metrics or risk being dropped from their panel of brokers. Now, that's a very, very strong statement. This is real action. And in a further bold move, EPF are moving away from, you know, they had this approach of telling their investing companies, you know, what not to do, what we don't expect, all very nice and, and comfortable and polite. And they've now moved to, this is where you need to move towards. So pause, pause and reflect on that. You're going from being passive to being active, right? proactive. And that's very strong. And another driver for this ESG consciousness or, you know, could, is probably also that um, a number of our local institutional funds have uh, uh, joined the UN Supported Principles for Responsible Investment and that network of investors. And whilst that in itself is not a driver, but it, you, know, you are showing a commitment towards upholding certain, uh, certain principles. Um, Kazana, Kazana, our uh, sovereign wealth fund signed on to this uh, PRI uh, in 2017, KWAP in 2018, EPF in 2019. So it is serious. Kazana is interesting because they see Malaysia in a, um, the, the ESG journey slightly differently from an EPF for historical economic reasons. And rather than directly um, drive these ESG investments like uh, the allocation of, uh, of assets like EPF, they focus in large part on uh, shareholder engagement. Um, and, and it is neither right nor wrong. It is just a different approach. And so long as it gives us the incremental change that we're looking for, I think we're all good. So it's inevitable that the ESG landscape in Malaysia will see increased focus on societal and governance aspects of ESG as we battle to save, may I say, it, both lives and livelihoods during this pandemic and beyond. Um, government in Malaysia is playing a significant role within the constraints of running a post-COVID economy. And I think we do need to recognize that because it is very, very real. All right. Um, in this ESG consciousness, uh, ladies and gentlemen in Malaysia is clearly going to vary by company, by industry, by geography, and dare I say, a phase of economic and social development. And okay, this is a generic enough statement to apply to any country in the world and any company in the world, but it is true. Uh, there's a truth about this. And ESG consciousness, at the end of the day, should result in a, a, an execution framework, translating good thoughts into uh, good deeds. And likely a framework that will continue to see almost, in, in our view, Seismic shifts, big shifts, as ambitions aspired to will be built on as ambitions achieved. Right? So the more we achieve, the more willing we are to set more ambitious targets. But, and that's why I say it's all about incremental change, because 
that journey is not linear. It, it becomes exponential if you take an incremental approach. So basically higher targets as we go along this journey. Some call this the ESG integration journey, establishing your baseline and then building a roadmap to rise well above it over a finite period of time. Finite being key because you can't have this open-ended. Right? And this is a show of commitment and a very necessary show of commitment. But ladies and gentlemen, clearly this process is agnostic. It's agnostic to issues of industry sector, geography, or pace of development, as I said earlier. So what typically happens for those of you, and I believe most of you have been involved at some stage in developing corporate strategy in your respective organizations. So companies will start off by assessing their current performance. Generally, it will be in financial terms, uh, you know, because that's what you speak about generally, generally when you front your shareholders. They then assess risk, as you would in any business strategy or corporate review exercise. You then discuss new business opportunities, as the focus must always be on growth and the creation of shareholder value, as we collectively expand the size of the economic pie. Now, this is where it takes a slightly different turn when you introduce ESG consciousness, because it then goes beyond just shareholder value creation deliberations, because it needs to be different because at the back of one's mind is also a very real need to focus on shareholder value destruction or at the very least value preservation. Now we need to think about this, right? So ESG is not just about going from you know, a, a baseline of profitability and moving it up. By not doing it, you probably move backwards. Destruction, value destruction, you may ask. Yes, value destruction that comes from customers no longer flocking to buy from companies without explicit ESG consciousness. Value destruction that comes from no longer attracting the best human capital because one has no ESG consciousness to speak of. Value destruction that comes from the dilution of brands and what, that, uh, and, and what they now come to be associated with. It takes a disproportionately longer time and effort to rebuild a brand than it does to build a brand and the association aspired. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we now have established is a call for action. A call to action. The call to action will now mean an undeniable need to set uh, ambitious business actions as part of this execution uh, framework, as I call it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wrap up by saying that most companies will likely go through um, a process that will probably look more like the following identifying elements of E, S, and G that most closely align with their vision and mission and goals, and those which carry a high degree of reality and practicality in terms of impact. And, I do, and we can't explore the definition of impact, but please accept that impact is you know, incremental change. Companies will then establish priorities and set quantifiable goals. This means establishing a baseline against which concrete goals can be set up and measured and managed and companies will then need to integrate these actions into their business strategy, into their governance frameworks, and in my view, most critically, into their corporate culture. Lastly, they'll then execute, they'll measure, they'll report, and communicate, communicate their efforts and outcomes. So ladies and gentlemen, ESG consciousness is key. It is key to driving cultural change. It is key to shareholder value creation. And I leave you with this thought. Unless we ground ESG efforts, unless ESG consciousness is reflected in, uh, in shareholder value, it will only ever be a, a phase and not a place. Right? So, and that's not what we want because this is not a phase. It's not a, 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 a fad. It's both here to stay and it is a new paradigm that we can either choose to ignore or embrace. And a phase engenders no sustainability, a place does. Uh, so thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity to share my thoughts this morning. Can't. You're Sorry, on mute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Ramesh, for the presentation. It's an honor to have you here with us today. Now we'll go ahead and take some time for questions. So the first question uh, is from Andy Chu. He said, Dear Ramesh, great to see you again. You mentioned about 45 billion ESG projects in the next five years. 
Is this enough to find a path for Malaysia to meet its embassy commitments under the Paris Agreement? Uh, good, you know, good question, Andy, and, and uh, nice to hear from you again. I, I don't, uh, I, I can't answer that question because I have no visibility around the composition of that pipeline. If, uh, you know, if it's, it's more uh, weighted towards climate-related uh, uh, projects, then, you know, I suspect we'll be well on our way. But I guess in any, it, it, it doesn't matter how you look at it, to achieve that within the next five years, I think will be a stretch for Malaysia. So I'd rather be conservative and say no, but that's not all bad as long as we're on the journey and we're moving in the right direction and we're demonstrating that incremental change. Can't ask for more. All right. Um, he added another question. Uh, do you agree with the model adopted by the EU, where legislations are used as an instrument to hasten the speed for sustainable investment? Example, EU taxonomy, etc. Is this model suitable for developing countries like Malaysia? Yeah, again, fantastic question. And you know, there's two sides to this, right? Because uh, mature economies uh, like uh, the EU uh, in some ways need to legislate, you need to legislate. You, you, you establish a baseline for uh, for society effectively. The, the, the challenges we face in this part of the world is vastly, vastly different. We're talking about different poverty levels. Right? We're talking about basic infrastructure that doesn't exist or needs serious upgrading. Um, and if we were to legislate and skew the uh, resource allocation, the allocation of capital because of legislation, I fear that those very, very basic things that we need to address in, uh, in this part of the world will get compromised. So that's not to say we go out and, and, and destroy the environment and cut down old growth forests. And, and no, I think let's be practical about it. I think there's some things that we clearly are never going to support doing but I'm not going to advocate legislating and thereby skewing resource allocation into things that are a priority in a country like Malaysia at this stage of our economic development. Okay, uh, the next question is from Jason Lee. He asked about carbon credits and impact of ESG on cost of capital of companies. Is there a private market solution to climate change? Yeah. This is very dear to my heart because uh, because one of the things that we uh, at UNGC are looking at doing and uh, actually, you know, I, I may as well take the opportunity to, to announce it here is that we're looking at launching a, a private sector carbon credits exchange uh, because it doesn't exist. And, and, and of course, when we talk about carbon credits, you know, if I could have five minutes to just go into it a little bit. So you have your, your regulated market and your voluntary market. Your regulated market is where, you know, if you're having a, uh, if you're running a renewable energy project before you even turn over that, 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 that first piece of earth to start building your plant, you have to have your project registered and approved. Uh, and, uh, and that process is not an easy process. You're probably looking at three years minimum to get a project approved. And so for three years, you don't start your project, right? So it's, but when you do get it approved, if you do get it approved, then those credits are worth quite a lot of money. I think the last time I looked, they were trading at 60, 65 euros a ton. And uh, it's, it's fantastic. But under the, the, the UN framework, you're not going to get a carbon credit if the economics of the project stand on the own. So the project is viable without carbon credits, you won't get carbon credits. They supplement to make a project feasible. So that's the background to it. But we also have all of these uh, renewable energy players in Malaysia who've gone out, built plants, and in effect, they're displacing fossil fuel powered uh, electricity, right? Energy. So they do generate carbon credits, and that's what we, we refer to as the voluntary market. And, and you know, so you, you know, a small renewable energy plant throws up, let's call it 20,000 tons of carbon credit. And so they're in a positive. Right? So if you've got someone out there in Malaysia who's got a 20,000 ton carbon footprint and who wants to uh, to, to create a uh, achieve a carbon uh, neutral footprint, they go out and they buy this. Now the problem we have in Malaysia is we don't have this platform, we don't have this exchange. But 
uh, the UNGC is working actively with the private sector to create this exchange. And we hope to announce this in the not too distant future. So let's bring it back to financials. How does this affect uh, cost of capital? Uh, so, uh, and so I think the, the pricing of carbon credits must necessarily affect the cost of capital. Uh, there was a recent article, and I forget who it was uh, by, uh, speaking about the, the pricing of carbon credits globally is, is probably got some way to go. Right? It, it isn't at a price yet that is driving that shift towards uh, non-fossil fuel uh, energy. And of course, that then impacts, impacts your cost of capital. So very necessary. Yes, it will. And it needs to do so for us to go uh, to move in the right direction. Okay, so we have another question from the floor. Uh, do you agree that risk management practices will play a very important role in ESG for businesses? If so, any views on where should it start or focus? Yes, risk management is very, very important. And you know, the second part of uh, my, my, my presentation just now, I, I spoke about I spoke about ESG consciousness largely being uh, a culture, a corporate culture. Uh, and maybe in term, it, maybe it's not even a corporate culture. Maybe it's just culture full stop. You know, because it doesn't stop at, at it doesn't start at nine o'clock and ends at five o'clock when you leave the office. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. It's a consciousness that you take home with you. It's a way of living. Right? It's not something you just add on for eight hours a day. So. Um, the risk, of course, uh, the risk management really is about, um, you know, to mitigate this, you know, to mitigate that shallow thinking, that thinking that it, it is an add-on. And I think if that's the pinnacle, you know, if we start off with that, that's the highest level in terms of uh, level of abstraction, that's your highest level point, then moving down, I think that the clarity, the visibility becomes so much greater. Uh, that in everything we do, we do it with a, a consciousness that, uh, that, that, that says uh, there's no actions, there's no strategy, there's nothing we're going to do that's going to leave the planet worse off or society worse off or create uh, opaqueness when there should be transparency in our governance framework and so forth. So risk management is so important. I did say during my talk that there's risks uh, in, in this whole space, but those risks create opportunities. And how you translate risk into opportunities is exactly that, is how you manage risk, right? And we go through those, you know, those typical risk evaluation methodologies. We look at impact, we look at probability of occurrence, you know, and these are time and tested things that we've done for 30 years, right? So look at those opportunities there. And, and, uh, and, and I think, uh, uh, you know, build your ESG framework around it and, I'd be surprised if uh, you know it didn't result in well, my view, shareholder value creation or at least preservation. All right. Okay. So the next question: um, Singapore is launching a carbon exchange. What mm. about an Islamic Sharia compliant exchange? <laughs> well, you know, I said I said just now, um, Singapore's exchange is a uh, is. Uh, it's you know within a the legislative framework the, the government uh and it's it, it's a fantastic initiative and it's a far far bigger thing than what we envisage in malaysia it, it is uh you know so you could have your regulated carbon credits being traded on the singapore exchange we don't have that in malaysia yet uh we are we ungc are in discussions with the government about the creation of such an exchange uh so i can't comment on whether it becomes sharia compliant uh you know, or not, I suspect it will be. The one that we are talking about uh, with private sector at the moment is in fact a Sharia compliant exchange. It, so what that simply means is that we're not going to trade carbon credits where the source comes from non-Sharia compliant industry, for example. So that's very, very real. Yeah. Okay. okay, so the next question. What is your view on companies that would only react to ESG when the time comes? Well, I think I'd stop investing in them. So that's it, right? I mean, this is, uh, you know, if, if there isn't a recognition as to the criticality of this whole thing, then it speaks of the leadership. 
And I, I have to stop there because it just speaks of the leadership. And, uh, and you know, it may have worked for the last 50 years, but chances are uh, the next generation of, of, of uh, employees, you know, people who, who are in their mid-20s, my children and your children, are probably not going to be sending their job applications into companies like that. Chances are they're going to skew their interests, which means the best human talent and the best human capital to companies that not just demonstrate this, this huge bottom line in terms of dollars and cents, but also a commitment towards the environment, and social issues and governance. And I, I we're already seeing that. I don't even think this is, a, I won't even use the word anecdotal evidence. It's not, it's got, gone so far beyond. And, and if we in Malaysia still uh, hung up on that sort of thinking, well, then, you know, you know, we sort out the men from the boys. Tough luck. Okay, so moving okay. on to the next question from the audience. Um, what are your thoughts on the waste separation management in Malaysia? What could be done to improve it as there have been a few setbacks in policy initiatives? Yeah, yeah, I... I, I I, I think there's, there's been quite quite a lot of uh, complex issues uh, around what should should be a relatively simple thing to uh, yeah, to to manage, and you know at the at the outset it's about you know we it starts off very basic right we have one rubbish bin to throw our rubbish in right and most other countries have like three right you have your 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 recyclables and plastics and you know, whatever so and we we haven't got to that stage yet. So that starts, creates the issue of waste separation. It creates this issue of moisture content and all that. So we're already starting with, you know, behind the eight ball, as we say. And then this flows through to the collection centers. So rather than having sorting done in our homes, we're then looking at having to sort at these waste sites, which becomes a bigger issue again. Because it, it is, it requires far more effort for something that could have been done at home. Then we have the issue of responsibility for waste collection. Uh, you, you know, do we hand a contract out to one party to collect waste for the whole country, or do we hand it out? We disperse it. Do we make it uh, at the other extreme, a regional, a local level initiative? There's questions there that need to be deliberated and and, and reviewed. Right? What's the most efficient uh, model? And then there's the choice of technology, whether you go for incineration technology, which clearly has some uh, environmental impact, or you know, uh, uh, using thermal uh, uh, technology where you just use heat and you don't have that that effluence of ash and so forth, and you have the creation of fertilizer, or fertilizer of char. So that's an added benefit. You know, the other extreme, and there's so many other technologies in uh, in between. Uh, that have come up over the last uh, 20 years. I, uh, you know, personally, I was involved in building a, a waste to energy plant uh, some years ago uh, that with some Korean technology and it worked out in, a, in, in, a, in, in a different country and it worked out really, really well. Um, but why it worked out well was because we had the waste separated in people's households before we collected it. And, uh, and so the process was relatively uh, not painless, but a lot less painful. So, so there are policy issues that need to be dealt with, there's vested interests that need to be addressed uh, if we are to take this seriously. And there needs to be uh, funding around the, 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 the research into, into technology. Although having said that, there's already a lot of very, very efficient technology uh, globally that, uh, that could be used. But uh, personally, I don't see this as being, I don't see uh, waste to energy as being a a national sort of uh, initiative. This needs to be really local. This needs to be, this needs to be, you know, a, a two megawatt power plant in a, a kampong somewhere that uh, uses as its feedstock the waste from the local community. It's self-contained. It's a closed ecosystem. It creates jobs for locals. It's low cost. Uh, it's a low cost operation, and it's clean, right? And and that this parrot sort of model is what I would advocate if we are to make inroads into sorting out the waste issue and creating energy. Okay, uh, on to the next question. 
In the local ESG scene, do market players really place adequate emphasis on human rights by analyzing businesses' complicity in war crimes worldwide? Can you, can you repeat that question again? Your line dropped out. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, in the local ESG scene, do market players really place adequate emphasis on human rights by analyzing businesses' complicity in war crimes worldwide? Yeah, so difficult, difficult question. Uh, I think there's a huge scope for, uh, for improvement. Uh, we can be doing a lot, lot more. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't want to get started on, you know, doing like a comparative study between, uh, say, workers' rights in Malaysia compared to the UK or Australia, you know, because I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, we're, we're wrong or they're right or vice versa. I'm saying that we're in a stage of development where, uh, you know, we can be doing a lot more and we should be doing a, a, a lot more. And this definition of human rights, unfortunately, then, you know, leads into, again, you go through a level of abstraction, it leads into all sorts of other issues that become very, very uncomfortable for discussion uh, because we as a society as, uh, are not yet ready to face up to certain issues. So we ignore it and by implication, you know, it, it, it it filters down into into issues like like human rights. Um, so, you know, I take the view that we keep pushing it, we keep pushing, and we make sure that you know we reach the, the, the best standards in this planet in terms of human rights. And we shouldn't back off that. We shouldn't back off that. But at the same time, I want to see industry continue. I want to see jobs being created, and we'll support that as well. But we'll be very vocal and we'll be very clear about our position on uh, on uh, compromises to, to human rights. But I think that's as much as we can do at this point in time. All right. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, the next one, who should take the lead in ESG adoption in Malaysia? The government, corporates, or investors? Corporates is my view. I think, as I said, it's a consciousness. It comes from within. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't subscribe to, uh, I, I do it because it's government policy, like the EU discussion we had earlier. Or I do it because my investors are asking me to do it. It needs to come from within. And so corporates need to take the lead. And that's why UNGC exists, right? We work with corporates uh, to bring this consciousness. And, and it's been a successful model globally. So it needs to start because you see a reason for doing it, not because you're forced to do it. That's when it becomes real. Uh, it doesn't mean that investors shouldn't place pressure. They should, governments should create a policy framework, yes, but ultimately the corporates need to take responsibility. Yeah. And okay, it's not the big corporates only, right? It's the SMEs as well. Okay, so this is the last question. You said that you are looking for incremental steps. How incremental are we looking at here? <laughs> okay, incremental means that when I wake up tomorrow morning, there's an improvement to what I left yesterday. That's incremental, right? It's not a matter of uh, shades or degrees of, you know, it's a 5% or a 50% improvement. So long as there is an improvement, so long there is a change, then you're heading in the right direction. You know, because if you start off with one and tomorrow it's a two, you've doubled. And if the next day the two becomes a four, you know, you've doubled again. But when you plot that graph, it's not linear, right? It's an exponential graph. And so I, in, in that finite timeline, I still achieve a lot more than I would otherwise have if it, it, it was just drifting, right? And, or if we force things uh, on, onto, onto an organization. So incremental change in whatever shape or form, I welcome it because it shows commitment. And as long as it's not a one-off, it is a pattern of behavior, then I think we're in the right direction. All right, all right. it looks like we've covered all of our questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Ramesh. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience? No, I just applaud MIDF for you know taking this uh, this very public stance and in all the discussions we've had with, uh, with the other members of the leadership team. Uh, including Dr. Dominic and Dr. Sharon, we, you know, we, we really applaud uh, what MIDF are doing and we look forward to working more closely in, uh, you know, in, in pushing the whole uh, ESG agenda. 
uh, with yourselves. So thank you. Yeah, thanks again, Mr. Ramesh. Hope to see you again yeah. next time. Thank you. All right, uh, moving right into the next segment, which is the corporate spotlight. It is my pleasure to introduce our next guest speaker, Fanerul Hassana Ahmed, the Vice President and the Head of the Group Sustainability Division at FGB Holdings Berhad. Fan Hassana will be sharing with us about the development of ESG in her company. Fan Hassana, are you here with us? Hi, hello. Um, yeah. Hi. Yeah, okay. Over to you, Fan Hassana. Okay, give me one moment. Is my camera on? All right. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum and very good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks, Amalia, for for the introduction. So, uh, and thanks MIDF uh, for inviting FGV to share our initiative on, um, you know, ESG, complying to FE, ESG, and some of um, our programs, projects in FGV uh, that we believe um, would be uh, in, in line to achieve our commitment to sustainability. So if um, I have I have a presentation, let me see. Share, right. So for um, FGV, our vision um, is to be among the world's leaders, integrated and sustainable agribusiness that deliver value to customers and stakeholders, especially the smallholders. Uh, in terms of uh, the governance of sustainability, and I, I'm, I'm talking about sustainability from the context, uh, the, the encompassing uh, the economy, social, and you know governance aspect uh, in ESG. So the the concept of ESG, you know, is is captured um, in corporate uh, and coined uh, in the word of sustainability. So in, in MGV, our sustainability governance goes directly to the board. So the board has um, an oversight as to um, our sustainability agenda and the priorities for MGV. And uh, if you can see clearly in the presentation, you know, um, on matters uh, relating to sustainability, um, it's not only that uh, the, the report goes to the board, uh, the, of course, uh, the BGRMC, the board's um, governance and risk management committee. And I think Ramesh spoke about, uh, you know, risk management, seeing sustainability or ESG issue as, as a risk management issue. And this is where, you know, for FGB matters relating to sustainability is something that is very close uh, to the board and they want to understand what is our risk and how we are turning those risks into opportunity and how we are managing those risks. And uh, we also have an independent panel, uh, advisory panel for the board on governance and sustainability matters. So we have uh, a three panel members. Um, the chairman of this um, IAP is Dr. Uh, Johan Raslan the former PWT, PwC managing director. I think it's, it's a, it's a, he is a figure that is well known to most of us um, here. Uh, and uh, the other two members, um, you know, uh, players, international players in sustainability, human rights, social and environment. So we have this independent advisory panel advising the board on matters relating to sustainability and what areas that needs to be strengthened and addressed uh, by the management. Um, and, you know, um, just to, to also share that, you know, in terms of sustainability commitment, um, we, we have seen at FGV, um, one of our biggest challenge in FGV is uh, matters relating to social aspect, the human rights aspect. And um, from 2019 onwards, you know, our commitment to uh, our sustainability initiative has been drawn uh, from the UN Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights, UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and other um, ILO Convention uh, that is uh, necessary for us, you know, um, in order to ensure that our practices 
um, are in line with human rights principles, um, not only uh, those that are acceptable by Malaysia, but more importantly, you know, the uh, international standard which uh, we aspire to achieve. Uh, and we have also aligned our initiative with SDG. So you talk about uh, reduction of uh, reduction of poverty. You know, FGV being um, one uh, of uh, the company that supports um, smallholders, um, uh, Felda settlers especially. So eradication of poverty is one of the core issue uh, that we have been supporting um, uh, addressing hunger education gender equality um, in terms of human rights uh, in terms of labor rights so we have uh, you know supported that sdg initiative uh, within our operation and all this commitment is um, enumerated in our group sustainability policy which um, we have it online um, and uh, this is uh, uh, the document that govern FGV sustainability uh, initiative and also uh, commitment and it's only it's not only applicable to FGV but it is also uh, extended to our contract contractors suppliers and uh, vendors so you're not only talking about uh, this commitment only to fgv and our subsidiaries um, worldwide but this is also uh, applicable whatever commitment that we have with regard to the environment with regard to um, the social um, these commitments are also um, applicable to our our suppliers and um, we expect them to also embrace and move towards achieving the commitment so i'll talk a little bit more about what we are doing with our suppliers uh, later um yeah this is uh, sustainability at glance uh, for fgv um, i'll be speaking a little bit more on environment what we are doing currently what we have done and what uh, we plan to do uh, with regard to uh, our commitment um, to environment when Sorry, yes. sorry for interrupting. Can you zoom in your presentation? It's not yeah, on full uh, screen right now. Right now. It, can you see my presentation? Yeah, I can, but um, can you uh, click full screen? Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, Thank you, okay. let me see. All right. All right, is it better now? Sorry. Um, is it full screen now? Mm -mm. Not yet. It's still sorry, this, it is it still not. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Uh, let me try again. Sorry, everyone. So this is Murphy's law. Um, and I'll try to stop sharing and reshare. Let's see if that works. Um, give me one moment. Is it working now? Oh, hold on. Or oh, alternatively, I have also emailed the presentation to to uh, the secretariat. Maybe if, uh, if it helps, maybe you can project, and I'll. Okay. Wait. Uh, okay, I can share it for you. Are you can unshare first? All right. Thanks, yeah. So while that is being uh, being assisted, thank you for the assistance. So maybe what I can I can also highlight is you know uh, what we have seen at uh, uh, FGB um, is uh, the evolve evolution of the concept of you know. Uh, from what is known as social responsibility, from what is known as corporate social responsibility. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Puan Hasana, please continue. Okay, all right, okay. Um, uh, evolution from the concept of responsibility to the concept of respect. 
So I, I think this is a, a big shift uh, for for many corporate sectors, you know. Um, and, and I hear Ramesh, uh, I, I heard uh, Dr. Chand, uh, Chandran every uh, earlier, you know, talking talking about um, how the corporate should take the lead in terms of um, ensuring. Uh, uh you know our esg commitment our esg uh, initiatives are at par or is or, or inculcated it as a value to 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 uh, the company and i i agree with uh, with that notion you know uh, and internationally also um the concept of responsibility is moving um to the concept of respect which requires company you know to look uh, at issues relating to environment, social, uh, human rights beyond the lens of it's your responsibility, but now it's your duty to respect. So I, I think in terms of the environment, um, you can see that the early emphasis, especially with regard to FGV, that is a company uh, that uh, relating to plantation, the early activities, if we can move to the next slide, uh, I'm not sure uh, if we can move to the next slide, yeah. The early, uh, uh, the early focus on environment has always been from the risk perspective, climate risk. So we are being monitored, you know, uh, in terms of our operation. Do you do you engro uh, encroach into forest? Uh, you know, it's it's it goes back to the concept or, or the principal commitment of no defo deforestation. Uh, if you do, and 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 I tell you because of the satellite uh, uh, image and all that and monitoring, no companies that are, is doing plantation can avoid being surveillance. You know, you you are always under the camera or under the satellite, and they know if you, you know, uh, open new areas. Um, and especially if that area is a forest area. So they will come back to you and, and say that, you know, the, it, you have, um, you know, cleared this forest and this is against our principle. Uh, this is against your commitment. So what are you going to do with that? So for company like FGV, we have a very strong commitment on deforestation, no deforestation. So new areas will not be expanded. Uh, unless it is brown field, you know, unless it is already developed earlier and uh, converting it into oil palm plantation, um, subject to many rigorous proced procedures and uh, process, of course, but it's allowable. It's, we will do that. But if it's in for the, the area is forest, definitely that is a, a no go for us and also our suppliers. So, you, this, this, this are uh, the the old. Um, I would say the previous, um, uh, you know, monitoring that we have been doing. You know, they are they are looking at us in terms of our commitment to no development on peat. Um, what have you been doing? Again, it's under the satellite uh, monitoring. They know where you are, what you are doing. Um, when I say they we are referring to our our buyers our uh, end users our customers our consumers you know they, they they would be able to detect um in in terms of um what actions we are taken with regard to our commitment to manage the peat in our operation and uh, management of biodiversity so these are all what i'm saying is that in the past um we have seen it from the climate risk um, approach where you need to have mitigation actions so how do you mitigate uh, if that is the case of no deforestation it's mostly reactive but now people are already moving towards you know asking about what are you doing with climate action what are your commitment uh, to to uh, achieve net zero. How are you doing? Uh, how are you managing your waste? I, and I think Ramesh and uh, uh, speak uh, quite uh, a lot with regard to uh, the need for companies to take lead in climate action, renewable energy waste management. And are you going to have? A com are you going to commit to net zero? And if you do, are you going to adopt the science-based target and all that? These are the questions that are coming to FGV now. And uh, and for FGV, renewable energy is not something alien to us because we have. Um, uh, given that we are operating mill and uh, palm oil mill, we have actually established or uh, installed 
28 biogas facilities um, in our mills. So we have um, methane captured facilities um, that that can uh, generate, you know, uh, energy. Uh, we have been generating electricity for rural electric uh, electrific electrification if we can go uh, if can we can move to the next um you know uh, slides um and uh, we also have um we have also uh, you know uh initiative um that from our empty fruit bunch you know the uh, that that also is being used uh, to uh, re to create renewable energy uh, and these are some of the conservation program that we have in FGB, um, the Sun Bear Conservation and also Human Wildlife Conflict. Uh, this is uh, some of the programs that uh, we have to manage uh, the environment or the uh, high, high conservation value area in our operation. If you can go to the next slide. I think that the next slide that I want to talk more. Yeah, so this, this is uh, how we generate ren renewable energy. Um, from the methane captured and palm waste at mills. So we have, um, uh, you know, uh, in Jenka, we have fit in tariff where we work with um, uh, Tanaga National, um, TNB, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, send our uh, electricity to uh, their, uh, to, to generate electricity for TNB. And we have bio CNG facilities in uh, Sungai Tenggi, Selangor. And of course, in Sabah, we have uh, two projects that is, uh, you know, uh, supporting the electricity in uh, two um, uh, areas in Sabah, that is in Sahabat and in Umas uh, Kalabakan. Uh, it's quite a rural area from uh, Lahad Datu. So that that is being that township is being uh, you know uh, supported, being powered through this initiative in Umas. So if we can go to the next slide. So the second aspect with regard to um, what uh, FGV is also focusing is on um, social and human rights, and I think uh, it's not something uh, a secret that you know the issues uh, on FGV with regard to uh, how we manage our labor uh, I believe uh, you have, might have heard about uh, the US ban um, on FGV's pump product for um, you know the risk of forced labor so we in FGV you know um, have been working on programs, initiatives to enhance our labor practices, to ensure that whatever uh, we do um, with regard to management of our migrant workers are in line with the international standards, are in line with the ILO conventions. Uh, and uh, with that, you know, we have been um, doing uh, some initiative, including um, working with our affiliates, uh, Fair Labor Association, um, in uh, Washington to, en uh, to ensure that uh, you know, the rights of our migrant workers are protected. It's not an easy task. I'm not saying that, you know, this is something that um, most companies uh, find it, uh, uh, the, the, the requirement is not only to comply with national law, but the international law perspective. And also increasingly, we know that uh, we have been we have been uh, uh, monitored on matters relating to gender equality, women empowerment. How do you ensure that you know uh, there is uh, op equal opportunity um, for all person in your organization? And how do you ensure there's adequate protection uh, for issues involving women in your operation? And also um, because we are in plantation sector. And one risk, uh, one issue that will always crop up in the plantation is with regard to the presence of children in plantation. Uh, and uh, this is always um, linked to the risk of child labor. Um, and I, I, I believe internationally, when they see any children in plantation, the automatic perception is that it's they are working on the plantation 
Um, and, and I think that is one aspect that uh, many of the plantation companies in Malaysia um, is has been communicating internationally to say that you know culturally children do exist in plantation traditionally you know historically uh, because their parents are working in the plantation uh, and uh, in order to ensure that you know this uh, perception um, is uh, uh, contained or, or at least you know we are able to address effectively many of the companies including fgv we have our child protection program where the focus of this program is on ensuring children's access to school so um you know it, for for local children it's quite uh, straightforward because uh, they have access um, access to public schools uh, but we are working currently, and I think for FGV, we have 11 uh, child learning centre, um, community learning centre in Sabah especially, because uh, in Sabah we have quite a, a large population of children of our migrant workers. So in Sabah, we have established 11 community learning centre uh, with collaboration um, with um, the in Indonesian consulate teachers are from Indonesia and we provided the facilities, we uh, built the schools um, and we ensure that it's adequately, uh, facilitate uh, the facilities are adequate, uh, the water supply, electricity supply and all that um, we have uh, also supported uh, the, the, the program for education of children. So that 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 are some of uh you know our initiative and if we can go to the next slide i think the next slide speak a lot about what we have done with regard to the um addressing the issue of migrant workers if we can go to the next slide Yeah, so this is uh, this is some of our initiative uh, to uphold human rights and labor standard. Uh, we have a one-stop center because I, I believe in managing the um, uh, human rights issues, especially my, with regard to migrant workers. Uh, they require uh, you know information, correct information to be conveyed to all the potential workers that are coming into our operation. So that's why we have one-stop center. And due to COVID, you know. Um, we are not able to bring in more workers um, from um, uh, you know uh, India or Lombok but what before we, before 2020 we have established uh, you know one stop center in Chennai, Kolkata and also uh, Lombok Indonesia so what we do in this one stop center is before the interview process we make sure that we explain to all those who are present to uh, to uh, the interview uh, that they understand that they're coming in to work in the plantation. So one of the allegations that we have been uh, receiving and it's also put in uh, the issue that was highlighted by the US authority is that workers uh, are not aware that they're coming in uh, to work in plantation. Um, and they, they, are, they don't know that uh, they will be stationed in, uh, because plantation is usually in remote area. So they, they say that they are, they, are, they are promised something else, but they end up in remote area and by that they are being isolated and all that. So in order to ensure that there's no such misinformation conveyed to the workers, we have established this one-stop center. And uh, those who want to seek uh, employment with FGV will be interviewed by our personnel in this one-stop center. So we have our team from Malaysia going there to interview and before the interview, the present there will be presentation explaining to them with pictures and everything or where they are going to and what to expect. And if they are agreeable to all this, uh, you know, working in all this environment, then only we will interview them. So you will see that some of them left uh, uh, the, the center. Uh, uh, 
I assume we assume that because they are not, uh, you know, uh, interested to work in plantation. Uh, but those who are interested will be interviewed and, if suitable, recruited. So we also have guide uh, guidelines and procedures on responsible recruitment that is adopted in 2019. This is one of our measures to strengthen, um, you know, our uh, compliance uh, to protect human rights or workers' rights. The contract with recruitment agencies uh, are strengthened. Um, you know, we also have translated our contract with workers into five languages to make sure that they understand the contract. If we can go to the next page. Right. So, um, and, and uh, uh, for workers, you know, we have also uh, paid, uh, make sure that all their salary is paid through a bank account. So we have e-wallet system for them to, to use and they can use it, um, you know, at uh, upper, uh, easily to buy things and even to transmit money or remit money back to their home country. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, these are some of the uh, other initiative. Uh, another big challenge uh, or allegation that is uh, levied against company is with regard to the retention of passports. So in FGV, what we have done is uh, we have installed uh, safe boxes where workers can choose to keep their passport either in that safe boxes or they can keep it uh, with them if they want to. Uh, but if in case they lost it, then uh, the responsibility and accountability uh, on the safekeeping of the passport is with the workers. Uh, so that that is, uh, you know, uh, an initiative that uh, have been taken to ensure that we don't keep the employer don't keep the workers passport, uh, which is, by the way, one indicator of forced labor. So the workers' uh, housing is also something that we have been focusing on for the past three years. So we have invested more than 350 million to upgrade the housing facilities. So uh, and these housing facilities is in line with uh, the uh, uh, Act 446, the uh, Akta Perumahan, um, uh, you know, the Housing uh, and Basic Amenities uh, Act that. Uh, that is governed by the Ministry of Human Resource. So if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, the healthcare benefits, suppliers code of conduct, I will not go in, into details uh, on this. Uh, if we can go to the next one. So I talk a little bit about the affiliation uh, with Fair Labor Association. So in 2019, you know, um, as uh, as our one of our 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 big risks is uh, labor, uh, the management of migrant workers. So we have uh, become a, a participating company with FLA with the aim to get support to enhance our labor practices to make sure that you know whatever we uh, uh, do in FGV. Uh, is in line with uh, not only uh, our national law but also the ILO convention um, and uh, does achieve uh, international standards. Uh, so we have adopted in 2020 the FLA action plan to enhance our labor practices. This um, is for a period of five years. So we have had two assessment reports since 2019. Um, one in September 2020 and the other one just recently in March 2021. So there are uh, areas that we need to um, work on still, especially on uh, you know the overall monitoring of our labor management and that is something that we are committed to um, for the next uh, at least three more years. If we can go on to the next slide. Um, the other aspect that we are seeing in, with regard to the human rights compliance, um, a social aspect uh, of our operation is a uh, duty to respect rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. So um, we are working around areas where the presence of indigenous people, the presence of Orang Asli uh, uh, is there. So in, in any situation that requires us uh, to, uh, you know, manage land or, 
uh, extend land, uh, we will have these uh, principles to be followed, that is free prior and informed consent. And this is uh, also something that FGV has already included as part of our practices. But because we don't, at the moment, we don't have areas, ex expansion of areas um, in FGV that, uh, you know, go into uh, indigenous land, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't have, we have not yet really tried this, but we have this principle in uh, as part of our, our procedures in situation where uh, we need to um, consult and get consent from the community before we carry on certain operation. And likewise, we inform the community surrounding our operation that they can, in situation where they believe that our operation, you know, affected them, they can, uh, you know, channel their grievances, their, their issues, their complaint uh, to our management, and it will come straight uh, to, uh, you know, uh, the HQ. Uh, and we will look into the complaint and issue and uh, attempt to resolve it. So this is uh, some uh, one issue that we believe is increasingly being, um, you know, uh, monitored. Uh, and uh, people want to know how do you work with your community? How do you, especially if the community surrounding your operation, uh, that of indigenous community. So if we can go to the next slide. So the third aspect um, in our um, sustainability initiative is suppliers management uh, and monitoring. Um, I, I talked uh, earlier on about the group sustainability policy, GSP, that is not only uh, the commitment of which are not only applicable to our operation, uh, FGV and our subsidiaries, but also to our suppliers supply chain. So what we have done in managing our suppliers, you know, we have had several sessions, many sessions with our suppliers uh, uh, to, to share the commitment. Uh, and we are strengthening our traceability initiative. So when we do our traceability uh, and, and what we have done now, we are focusing on the um, business relating to plantation and also rubber with regard to the traceability for FGV. So we uh, we have understand who our suppliers are, uh, what are their demographic, um, whether they are small holders, you know, uh, mini estates, um, and, and uh, we have also uh, uh, do the risk mapping of our suppliers, you know, in identifying whether there are risks with regard to issues surrounding environment, or um, you know, risk with regard to the issues around human rights. So what uh, we have seen is that you know, um, we we realize that uh, it's it's quite a, a challenge uh, to manage uh, suppliers um, in terms of uh, requiring them to comply to our commitment unless we communicate with them in terms of what are we have to bring them in our journey. So we have our session educating them what are the commitment, what are the do's and the don'ts, and how we will support them. So we have had in terms of, you know, uh, our commitment to no deforestation, we inform them that, you know, they should not be clearing forests, primary forests, you know, uh, for palm oil uh, plantation. Uh, and if they do, it will be hard for FGV to continue, uh, you know, uh, doing business with them. And I think that there was one company that we have to ultimately make um, the hard decision uh, to cut the supply from that company because they uh, actually they cleared forests uh, to to uh, you know uh, develop for uh, the oil palm plantation, and uh, we speak with them, we discuss with them, you know, um, the air that you know, they should not be continuing the practice, but unfortunately, I think for their business reason, they continue to uh, clear forests. And on that reason, we have to, to stop doing business with them. Um, that is quite um, uh, sudden for us, but unfortunately, that is something that we have to do. Uh, and uh, uh, on matters relating to environment, deforestation, I think FGV is quite uh, uh, 
clear on our stand. Uh, and now we are also assessing our suppliers with regard to their compliance to human rights uh, aspect with regard to the management of their workers aspect to the, uh, with regard to the management of their uh, migrant workers if they do uh, employ migrant workers. So on matters relating to human rights, I, I, what we have done is um, we work with them um, in making sure that they understand um, why what are the, the the right things to be done how how it needs to be done and i must say that many of the our suppliers you know it's not that uh uh they they don't want to do uh, they don't want to get things right for example uh, one small example is with regard to the minimum wage um, and, and you're talking about Pachi Pachi in, in the remote area yeah, because we work very, very closely. Uh, most our, of our suppliers of uh, uh, wasawit of fresh uh, fruit bunch um, are from smallholders, yang Pachi Pachi, Machi Machi in, in remote area. And, and we have to educate them that look this is uh, what the law says minimum wage this this is how much and you have to make sure that there is deduction for epf deduction for uh soxo and all that uh, and and sometimes it's it's just that talks that they need to ensure that you know they comply with uh, and respect the rights of their workers so where uh, our suppliers, uh, you know, understand that they need to do that. They will do that. And we have seen transformation in terms of um, how suppliers uh, work with us in ensuring that they respect the rights of their workers. And of course, with regard to the issue of um, child uh, presence in plantation, um, this is one of the aspects which is quite natural uh, to Pachi Pachi and Machi Machi in 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 small holdings, especially where the children come in during uh, school holidays to help them, um, and this is also another uh, you know education that we need to to uh, inform the 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 suppliers that this uh, what what are the do's and the don'ts with regard to the presence of children in their, their operation in their small farm. So these are some of the initiatives that. Uh, Currently, uh, we are doing with our suppliers to ensure that they are uh, able to comply with our commitment to sustainability. And, and I, I think uh, I will stop here, Amalia, um, and uh, I'll open to uh, receiving questions um, and sharing uh, uh, and listening to, to your side as well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Puan Hassana. So now we'll move on to the Q&A session. The first question, um, on FGV's RE initiatives, is there any future plan to expand your bio-CNG effort other than Sungai Tenggi? Yes, uh, yes, I think that is uh, in one, uh, it is in our plan, you know, uh, for FGV to expand our renewable energy initiative, uh, including bio CNG. Uh, but I, I believe, uh, you know, uh, in, in moving forward, that would be uh, an area that FGV would be focusing on. We have in total 67 mills, um, and, and that 67 mills are the opportunity for FGV to support our climate action initiative. At the moment, only 28 mills, um, you know, um, are, are, um, uh, have the facilities, uh, renewable energy facilities, including Sungai Tengi for bio CNG. Of course, we are looking into a uh, plan uh, to expand this renewable energy initiative for FGV. Okay, uh, the second question. Based on your experience, what are the top challenges being the head of Group Sustainability Division in a large group like FGV? And what is your advice for a company that wishes to set up such a division? Well, uh, I believe um, one of the challenge that uh, we have um, is um, inculcating values, cultural, 
I think that that is something that um, uh, is common throughout. When you talk about sustainability, you know, sustainability is actually not something new, but it is presented as if it's a new thing. You're talking about something that is good. I always say to 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 my team that you know su sustainability is a very technical term, but actually what we are looking for, what we are promoting, is good practices with regard to how do you manage your waste. You know, even at home, you have to manage your waste. You cannot just simply buang your your waste just like that. You know, you need to know how to do it. It's a, it goes back to values. So I think that would be the biggest challenge, um, you know, um, in in uh, uh, for sustainability as a head of sustainability. But again, if you reduce your term into common language people's term, I think people begin to relate. Uh, the term sustainability sometimes is unrelatable. ESG is unrelatable because it sounds bombastic. But when you go down to the basic to say that, okay, look, you shouldn't be doing this to your workers, right? You shouldn't, you should pay their salary. You should ensure that you don't deduct uh, their salary unnecessarily. So these are all the component of respecting rights aspect. Uh, how do you communicate? So when you go to the, when you go to the basic, I think people on the ground understand uh, and they start to, see that oh this is not something new this is something that we do every day uh, how do you manage your waste we do that every day you know you don't want you don't want uh, 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 to be uh, to practice open burning because it will definitely impact the environment but it's wrong anyway so how do you do how do you communicate and i think that's that's one of the challenge that we face initially um, with uh, uh, you know sustainability, but along the way, once uh, you have uh, you know been able to demonstrate that it is actually close to your heart issue, then you see changes. And of course, uh, the top management, the leadership of the company, needs to also speak and send the same messaging that this is something that is uh, important for the company as a whole. You know, uh, the last thing you want. Uh, is conflicting to hear is conflicting messaging uh, from the leadership. So that that is one thing that uh, I think uh, would be uh, something to keep in mind when you establish um, your sustainability division or department. All right, uh, moving on to the next question. Human rights is an evolving concept and abuse of human rights is one of the many components that can define the ethics of business conduct. So from the sustainability and governance standpoint, how does FGV make sure the company is well informed on other companies' unethical conduct? Uh, other companies' unethical conduct, I take it, you know, uh, like our suppliers, uh, because we would not be able to judge any other companies. But we have, uh, uh, we can and we do manage our suppliers to ensure that, you know, whatever uh, products or, or, or fruits or whatever uh, material that come into our operation are through responsible uh, business conduct uh, and practice. So as I mentioned earlier, we have um, uh, this commitment um, to that in our group sustainability that is extended to our suppliers and our vendors. So how do we manage them? Uh, we have uh, all our suppliers are required uh, to, to, to sign a pledge, if, if you may want to put it, but we call it suppliers code of conduct. Um, and in the suppliers code of conduct, we mentioned clearly that, you know, these are the things that uh, you need to comply with, including the practices relating to environment, the practices relating to respecting human rights. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we do monitor, we, uh, we have self-declaration. Uh, there are questions that we give to them and uh, we have now a program, uh, traceability and validation. We have a task force in our operation. Uh, in my my team, uh, we have a task force that um, you know uh, validate um, all the self declaration that is sent to FGV. 
Um, and I, I think this is something that is common in many plantation company, at least I can speak for. Um, you know, I have seen many other plantation companies uh, adopting similar similar approach. You have you require your your suppliers to do self declaration, and there is validation on your operation. So that's what we are doing now. And I said, as I said, once we found any um, risk um, of non compliance, either from environment or um, human rights perspective, uh, we will work with um, the suppliers. Uh, we don't simply cut them off, but we work with them and uh, to make them align to our commitment. Um, and uh, we will gauge and assess uh, their 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 level of commitment. You can tell whether you know your suppliers is is uh, is really honest or genuine um, in uh, transforming. Um, and, and that's what uh, we have been doing, and uh, we we intend to continue doing this. Um, we will do this, and uh, we have already a team working on this. Okay, so the next question: What does FGV do to promote its values to other players in the industry? Well, I think what we can do, and what we have been doing, is uh, sharing of what um, you know what uh, small practices that we have done i'm not i i, I think um, in all honesty um, fgv is relatively new to all this um, initiative um, in terms of you know um, not new uh, what i'm saying is we are new to coming out to tell the world um, in terms of what we have been doing we have started this initiative much earlier uh, but uh, what personally I'm seeing is that we're learning as much as uh, from other partners, as much as we're sharing. So it's it's like, you know, uh, when you share, you have more to learn. And that's where uh, the platform like, you know, um, for FGV, because we are a palm industry, uh, you know, the platform like RSPO, the platform like, uh, you know, MPOA, um, you know, the initiative with Poram and all that are, are some of the areas where we take learnings from others and we share our learnings as well. Um, and we have common objective because at the end of the day, FGV and many other palm industry is supporting the the national economics you know you, and especially with regard to fgv we you are talking about the settlers the smallholders because most of our um, uh, supply 70 percent of our supplies come from external parties uh, from smallholders felda settlers and we need to to share this you know um and, and our initiative how we're doing this uh, and we have more to learn from others, I must say. Um, there, yeah. All right, uh, the next question that we received from the floor. In regards to the negative publicity from the Western countries, especially in terms of labor practices, do you think this issue is more of a miscommunication or different labor standards? Uh, it's a bit of both. both. It's a mix of both. Uh, uh, you know, when you talk about human rights principle and uh, having the experience of working in this area, um, I know that, you know, when you talk about human rights, it's nothing but evolving and growing. Um, and, and that could also be a challenge because when you achieve a, a, a standard that you believe, you know, is is acceptable then it, it evolved to a higher standard and that's something that we need to to continue um uh, to work on for for fgv and also for the industry and what i think would help is also um a, a more um you know a cohesive approach um between all players in malaysia because it's uh, the issue of labor human rights is not only affecting uh, one industry you have seen how you know um, other industry the manufacturing industry um, you know uh, uh, the factories are being affected by um, human rights issues 
uh, and, and because um, if you're talking about human rights, labor rights, um, companies or, or countries like Australia, uh, UK, they have very strict uh, slavery act, modern slavery act, you know, and and, and all this uh, uh, act adopt the international principle, adopt international standard. It could be higher than Malaysian standard, but in order for you to 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 um, you know be competitive competitive in international market, you know a company needs uh, to adopt the highest standard and must ensure that their operation is in line with the international standard. Um, uh, otherwise, you would face um, challenges in marketing your products internationally, and that could also impact. Um, uh, you know, uh, by extension, uh, your suppliers um, in our case, uh, I keep going back to the smallholders, to the pachi machi, you know, because that's the reality on the ground. Uh, their livelihood depends on how you manage your practice. Uh, I mean, your like FGV, how you manage uh, our practices, um, you know. That that is something that I think our leadership in FGV understand, and we want to ensure that we achieve and we are able to address all these allegations. Um, uh, and and allegations may be true, may be not. And if uh, we found any gaps in our operation, that's where you need to admit and remediate. And I think that's where FGV and many other companies um, who have embraced uh, the U UN guiding principles on business and human rights are moving forward because one of the uh, criteria in that is, you know, you have to assess and identify your gaps and admit that there are gaps and work to remediate the gaps, you know, um, correct it, make it right again, and then communicate tell the world that you have been doing that. So I think that's what FGV has been doing. And if you look at what, um, you know, our com communications um, uh, since 2018, 2019, we have been sharing in terms of what we have been doing to transform our human rights um, pr uh, practices with particular em emphasis on um, migrant workers, labor rights. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, the next question. You are rated as 4, which is the highest in terms of the ESU rating by FDSA Russell. How difficult is it to maintain this high rating, especially for a plantation company? Um, well, I, I think uh, what we have done is uh, to continue to do the right things. Uh, we have put, uh, we have also done internally an assessment as to what are the criteria, the rating criteria, um, uh, on what we are still lacking, and how and what actions that we need to do, and the timeline that we need to do to to um, achieve higher rating or sustain the current rating. So where we are high, we should not go below the rating standard. And we have to ensure that whatever we have done so far um, is, uh, is, is continue to be, you know, at that standard or higher. So I, I believe that is something that uh, is already in our, um, you know, yearly, annually assessment internally for FGB. So that is what we do every year. We look at uh, the ratings that, uh, uh, you know, on FGB and how we can um, move forward. All right, uh, the next question. From the technology perspective, uh, what are your thoughts on the technology utilization by the palm oil players to address ESG concerns? Yeah, uh, I think from the technology, this is uh, an area that is evolving yeah, uh, in, in uh, palm oil plantation. Um, I, I speak about I speak a, a bit about you know the satellite monitoring where you know uh, in monitoring environmental commitment um, we use satellite image to and ensure that you know there is uh, no risk with regard to um, extension in forest area and I talk about our suppliers that we have to cut off that is through the image satellite monitoring. So that 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 is uh, an, a, a, a technology that we're using, and uh, I believe uh, with regard to um, the understanding 
uh, the social aspect um, of of uh, the risk. Uh, this is something that we still need to work uh, a hybrid of technology and still the old fashioned for at least for MGV because as I mentioned, you know, you need to reach out to those who are in on the ground who might not be familiar with uh, with um, you know. Uh, technical issues, but if you're talking about um, our our operation in terms of um, uh, mechanization, which will in turn, you know, help in terms of uh, reducing um, uh, carbon footprint and all that, we have been working um, on some of this initiative um, uh, through our plantation uh, team. Uh, and we are also looking at uh, um, how this mechanization will support, uh, you know, in terms of uh, managing our labor um, use. Um, it will definitely uh, support in, uh, you know, uh, reducing reliance on uh, hard labor uh, with mechanization. And it will be, you know, supporting our uh, commitment to respect human rights, you know, it, it, it will something that uh, we look forward and we are committed to. We are working on it already. So uh, um, I may not be able to speak a lot uh, about all these issues, but I invite you to, to also, you know, reach out to me at any time um, uh, further. But we also have um, our, our publication on our web that you can consult to. Any further question, Amalia? Yeah, one last question. Uh, right. Moving forward, uh, oh, sorry. From the presentation, FGV has embraced ESG holistically. Moving forward, how will FGV manage the priorities between focusing the conventional financial KPIs to shareholders while constantly increasing ESG initiatives, which has a longer term positive implications? <coughs> Well, thank you. I think this is a very interesting question because um, you are right, you know, um, how do you balance that productivity and the expectation of the shareholders um, in terms of uh, the returns uh, to them? But what we are seeing increasingly, and I, I think this is what uh, uh, Dr. Charan and also Ramesh uh, speak to earlier on, is uh, investors are also looking at, you know, uh, what is your ESG commitment? How are you doing the, uh, in this area? What what are you? Uh, uh, how are you? What actions are you taking, or have you taken to address all these uh, risks? Uh, you know, in in ESG, um, and looking at all this, we believe, and I think at FGV, our leadership see that we cannot remain ideal, like do, doing nothing and be comforted with the convention. Uh, conservative way of doing business. You need to evolve. You need to to ensure that you have accountability uh, to your actions, um, and, and that is also uh, key to our our uh, uh, initiative in ESG. Uh, and I think the pressure does not only come from our investors. You know, investors are looking at us um, uh, as to how you. Um, you develop your ESG initiative, how you manage it, what is the board governance on this, but also our consumers, our 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 customers, uh, because our, our business is in a way, you know, uh, global, um, and we supply to um, brands, international brands that uh, have strong commitment. Mm -hmm. Uh, to um, ESG, and because of that, uh, you know, we have, um, we have, um, we must um, ensure that uh, for FGV, our 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 commitment, ESG commitment, um, is at par uh, with uh, the market requirement, investors' requirement, um, and, and to be competitive and to be able to, uh, you know, uh, meet. Uh, the, the at least we have some market share which will in return uh, be good for the shareholders so uh, that that has been you know our approach and and uh, our board understand that and in fact our board has been pu pushing for that and of course investors we have very strong investors that uh, are 
questioning us on you know our ESG initiative and commitment so we cannot run away no business can run away you need to for business you need to insulate yourself uh, with all this ESG commitment and move forward but you can never isolate you know if you you continue to to uh, continue your traditional way of doing business you know the conservative way um you will be isolating yourself from the world and i think it will affect your business eventually sooner maybe sooner than later yeah that's that's from me amalia all right yeah we've reached the end of our q a session thank you so much for hasana for your presentation we hope to see you again next time yeah, thank you, Amalia and uh, MIDF for, for uh, you know, uh, inviting MGV. And as I said, if there are any follow-up questions, you know, any, any, any inquiries, any sharing of learning that MGV might be benefiting from, uh, you know, the, the, those who are present here, please feel free to drop me an email or reach out, um, you know, through our web. So thank you, Amalia and MIDF for right, inviting thank you. Take care, everyone. All right, uh, now we will take a short break. Uh, we'll resume at 11 a.m. for our next segment. And can I ask the audience to refresh the streaming page uh, before we start the next segment? We'll take a short break. We'll continue at 11 a.m. All right, it's 11 a.m. Up next, we have a panel discussion that will dive deeper into investing in ESG. Please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Wanner Aisha Sa'at, Chief Investment Officer of MIDF Amana Asset Management Berhad, and our second panelist, Mr. Devendran Sinodurai, Executive Director of Nat Zero Capital Group. The panel discussion will be moderated by Encik Iman Yusof, the Vice President and the Head of MIDF Research. I will pass it over to you, Mr. Imran. Uh, thank you very much, Amalia. <laughs> and thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, just a reminder to everyone uh, that have tuned in earlier, uh, please uh, refresh your streaming uh, view so that you can actually view this, uh, this uh, exciting panel discussion, I would say. So before we, we, we go into the panel discussion, uh, let, let, allow me to give a little bit of a background. Uh, well, sustainable finance is uh, generally referred to as a process of considering environmental, social, and governance factors uh, when making investment decision, leading to increased uh, longer-term investment into uh, sustainable economic activities and projects. Uh, its growth has been uh, driven by the desire of investors to have an environmental and social impact along with the economic performance of investing. And this growth uh, is a response to a larger trend, which saw many countries around the world uh, to mobilize effort to contribute to a global improvement. Uh, now, finance is taking its active position in trying uh, to implement this concept in the investing practice. Uh, sustainable investing became a part of uh, investing mainstream in 2020. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, it seems that investors might there, there are thoughts that investors uh, might ditch this whole idea uh, due to the fact that uh, it could be uh, some sort of a luxury uh, that can be afforded when the economy was growing uh, and markets were soaring, but not when the opposite was happening. But from the numbers, from the speakers that we uh, have uh, uh, came in before, I don't really think that is happening at the moment. And demand to invest in funds which focus on environmental, social, and governance issues jumped in 2020. Uh, and now the AUM stands uh, about 1.7 trillion. Uh, so what does it mean to invest in ESG? How is it done in practice? To discuss this issue today, we have two distinguished panelists and a strong proponent of ESG investing. Our first panelist is our own Puan Noor Aisha Saad, Chief Investment Officer of uh, MRF Amana Asset Management Berhad, 
who will be looking at uh, investing in ESG from an equity and capital market point of view. And our second panelist, Mr. Devendran Sinadurai, Executive Director of uh, Net Zero Capital Group, which is a private equity uh, firm specializing in ESG and impact investing. In fact, Mr. Devendran is an organizational activist at heart. He believes that new business models are required to fully capture the value of a net zero economy. And this model has to target impactful social ecological outcomes, promote ESG consciousness, and lead via data-driven insights. So welcome, uh, Puan Norasha and Mr. Devendran. Thank you so much for having, for being here uh, in the panel session. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe we will go right into the those those uh, questions. So uh, maybe uh, I'll start with Kwan No Asha first, uh, ladies first, <laughs> as usual. Uh, in your in your view, has uh, ESG entered the investment mainstream, and how is how is it? Uh, thank you, Ren, for the question. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, today. It's good uh, to have everyone um, around, and then hope everybody is keeping safe and healthy. And uh, again, thank you, Mr. Dave. Uh, glad that you are here with us today. And coming back to the question uh, just now, um, Imran, um, has ESG entered the investment mainstream? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, we see ESG investing has become uh, mainstream and becoming very central nowadays. This is after years of foundational efforts taken by various um, stakeholders, ranging from uh, regulators, asset owners and um, investors at large who have played an integral part in promoting and championing the sustainable um, agenda since then. If I can uh, recap, um, in the year of 2020, uh, 2014, the Securities Commission first uh, introduced the sustainable roadmap and also framework and also Brusa Malaysia in the same year in collaboration with uh, FTSE Russell um, introduced the uh, FTSE for Good Brusa Malaysia Index, uh, which provides uh, guidance for investors like us um, as a reference to use. And the current pandemic um, has made a more compelling argument and a stronger case for investors um, like us to consider investing um, in companies with strong ESD practices um, as their way of doing businesses and strategic planning. Um, given that these companies are more resilient and have outperformed relatively much better than those that are lacking in terms of the ESG approach. Also, interestingly, um, the first awareness of responsible investing has become more apparent, um, I can say, during the global financial crisis, when the realization arose that Sharia-based companies and sectors are more resilient and have been outperforming the conventional investing um, during um, crisis period uh, in particular. And the crisis, health crisis that we saw since um, last year has elevated this needs from a financial perspective, making ESG and Sharia principle being the outperformers globally. Um, as alluded by um, Dr. Sharon this morning also, we have seen in terms of the influx and also traction of funds coming into ESG uh, space uh, since uh, last year during the pandemic. And um, given the fact that both um, ESG and Sharia provide safety net and sustainable um, performance throughout this um, crisis period. Um, just to share also um, one um, a review by S&P 500 Global Market um, Intelligence, which signifies or suggests that more than 70% of ESG funds perform better than S&P 500, um, outperforming by as much as um, 20% during the pandemic period. And um, this has made a strong case for us um, as investors um, that there will be more traction and uh, greater demand uh, within this space going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Imran, can't hear you. Hear you, um, Imran. Um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I have uh, muted my mic earlier. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, Ponesha. Uh, maybe the same question to you, Mr. Devendran. Uh, from a private equity point of view, do you think that it has entered the investment mainstream and how? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, uh, thank you very much, first, uh, Imran and Imran Diaf again for uh, inviting us to participate in this. 
Uh, just a quick uh, background. I think really net zero capital is just focused on the capital formation aspects that are associated with preparing ourselves for a net zero ambition. So just to set, I think the framework, I think that globally there's this ambition that by 2050, we want to achieve a, a neutral position in terms of how we as people interact and utilize our ecosystem, the planet resources, to be able to create uh, abundance, right? And so what is really, really imperative now is what we do uh, this decade, particularly leading up to 2030, about preparing ourselves for that, for the possibility of that future. If we don't build that infrastructure, if we don't provide the resources, if we don't allocate our mindset for this, uh, then I think that's, that's going to be a difficult ambition to meet. So setting that groundwork is really, really critical. And, you know, net zero capital was set up for that uh, purpose to look at capital formation towards uh, making that uh, future possible. So coming back to your question around is ESG investment uh, mainstream, I think it's con at, at the heart of it, uh, and, you know, you can see it in terms of our uh, sort of tagline, which is around ESG consciousness. The I think ESG or responsible investment, values investment, so there's a lot of jargon around it, but I, and I think that's one of the issues that maybe we'll get into later on that I think that mindset in terms of being responsible for what you do has definitely played a lot of part in in the investment space, particularly since the 2008 sort of uh, global investment uh, capital crisis, right? So starting from the fact that everybody realized that you can't put all your money and just package triple A rated securities and think that that's the, the way to run. So money cannot be the sole objective, right? And so that sense of being uh, responsible for what you're doing, I think is definitely mainstream. I think the question, and from a private equity perspective, a private sector perspective, uh, it's, yeah, the private sector is really, really, I think, focused now in terms of how we can start, uh, yeah, investing more in, in responsible and sustainable investments. But um, yeah, there are other things that we have to start building together to actually start uh investing further in terms of esg all right uh thank you very much uh mr devendran uh, i think the next question goes to Puan Aisha. Uh how do esg criteria impact investment decision and your portfolio construction maybe we can give some color to that yeah uh Ren, yeah we believe that integration of esg into our investment processes uh, provides additional lens for risk assessments of our investment portfolios and um, the formulation of our investment strategy as well as our portfolio construction. Um, I must say that it is well anchored by our sustainability approach, which is guided by our investment philosophy that define us as a long-term fundamental fund managers with uh, consistent drive to achieve above average performance. Um, that is our um, key tenets in terms of our investment philosophy. And we believe that the integration of ESG is very um, essential, is imperative to guide and steer our investment decisions. Um, this is especially when we face uh, subjective assessments, for instance, um, in the context of assessing the management culture of business model, the long-term planning of the company's resources, and um, this is beyond the ROEs, ROEs, capital employed, PE and TA, and such assessments that we normally do. And besides that, um, ESG assessments also provide um, diversification of risk returns. That's what we believe. It enhances uh, portfolio stability by reducing the overall volatility. And what we observe is that um, Companies with um, ESG traits um, normally have a tendency for long-term consistent outperformance rather than just short-term uh, supernormal gains. And we take cognizant and mindful that there's no compromise in terms of delivering returns when we consider ESG for investing. That is for sure. And we believe that by embedding and um, integrating ESG, it acts as a natural screening enhancement process which facilitate our decision making across all our investment portfolios. And as Mr. Devendran alluded just now, uh, we have seen the troubles that have um, beset some of the public listed companies recently to the uh, workers' welfare issues and also governance um, 
issues which to some extent have um, affected in terms of their share price performance. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so basically, what you're saying is that ESG should come in not uh, at, ex at the expense of returns as well, uh, but you think that actually it can enhance us returns. Uh, fair, for, fair for us to say that, I think. Uh, the next question is uh, to you, Mr. Devendran. So when you look at ESG, uh, uh, or your decision to invest in a ESG company, be it in uh, whether on the equity space or on the private market space, so what criteria, criteria do you look for? Uh, and do this uh, ESG criteria help frame the strategy's uh, investment universe? Yeah, so if I may just uh, just add to what Pran Aisha said earlier. So I think there's this sense of like ESG, and I think this is something that uh, Ramesh uh, alluded to earlier as well. This ESG, my, the ESG is not a separate element. It's not like it's a two-dimensional space where you got financial value on one side and then ESG uh, yeah. sort of, uh, adherence on the other. It's actually about ESG integration. And I think that's the sort of term that is quite prevalent in the investment community now. And it used to be, you know, ESG in integration was like the early stage of Saria compliance sort of thing. So it was a screening out type. Uh, so are you just, uh, you know, are, are you investing in, in companies that are potentially maybe either obviously uh, exploiting the environment or carrying a higher ESG risk? But, you know, the, the, I think the bigger element now is what are you actively doing to take, uh, you know, to value the opportunities that are arising from a very different, you know, paradigm shift in the in our economic model. So, it, you know, fundamentally, we've got to move beyond. I think Sharon mentioned this beyond money. So, you know, even at the national level, it's about moving beyond GDP. And I think the that sense of being able to say that value is now structured under uh, at the heart of any value creation activity. It's about a social exchange, about us interacting here. So there's value being created through this dialogue. And as a result of that, there may be opportunities for us to do something. Uh, for example, you know, working together on improving uh, research and valuing ESG at a much, much higher level. So I think integrating these ESG criteria is the most important thing. And there's been a lot of work done in the, especially the public securities uh, environment uh, around you know, including ESG factors in beta, Right, so you know, ESG risk is now very much a critical part of uh, a portfolio analysis. Um, and then, but I think now actively, how do you start including targets? Right, what is the ambition of a company in that evaluation? Right, and these are all subjective, and this uh, sometimes can be quite tricky, particularly in the, I think, the public sector securities market. But the good thing about it in the private sector market, and you can see this with you know some of the largest. Uh, private equity firms from BlackRock and others who have really set the standard in terms of how they are going to do two parts of things. One, how do they actively evaluate and they've made you know, public disclosures about how they, they would look at this. And this could be, for example, looking at key targets that you expect a company to achieve. What are they setting up? There, were, there was a mention in, the, in FGV's presentation around science-based targets. So if you're a climate focus or climate impact company, then what are those targets? But then also in there is what are your enablers? What are the things that help you change your behavior? You know, gender uh, equality, uh, poverty eradication. So you know, it doesn't mean that a company has to focus on all of these things, but there are some critical elements of who they are and what they are becoming that needs to be included in this, uh, in, in this ESG space. And the last thing I think would have been, what are the synergies that they are sort of looking at as well in terms of their supply chain? their customers. So how are they interacting on a broader space beyond their own boundaries around changing that mindset? And then, and, you know, I think the presentation by uh, 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 the lady from Jennifer from uh, Fjolda was fantastic from FGV was really, you know, went to the heart of some of the things that you uh, we're starting to see now in terms of how companies and particularly investors are looking at companies and encouraging them to start on getting on this journey, right? Getting on this bandwagon to move forward on their ESG ambitions. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, on to the next question. Well, 
the ESG financial ecosystem is evolving, as we, we can see. We've talked a lot about that, uh, including uh, issuers and investors who disclose and use information related to the ESG issues. Uh, financial intermediaries, as well as government and international organization, are influencing emerging practices in ESG uh, investing. Uh, while constructive and inclusive progress have been made uh, to, do, to develop ESG practice by several ESG players, it has generated the spread of a wide array of investment terminology and disclosure framework, uh, which can, at points, seems a bit inconsistent and a bit confusing, I must add. So basically, ESG is broad enough to mean just about anything to anyone. So me being in the uh, research, we, we do find a bit difficulties uh, at the moment in embedding ESG into our analysis, uh, just due to the amount of data available. So from both of you, uh, maybe we can start with Puan Aisha first. Uh, ESG data issues. So how, how do investors manage this data gap? Yeah, it's very true, Imran. Uh, in general, there's uh, concerns about managing these um, data gaps as there's no defined um, standard or common practices to be used across um, industries as what we can see. Um, and, uh, in fact, managing data gaps applies to the overall um, industry as what we can observe for now. There are various sources of references for ESG methodology and approaches um, that are available um, in that sense, um, to be used by investors. At and by the app asset, um, to facilitate our decision, we make reference to FUSI for Good Brusa Malaysia Index um, provided by FUSI Russell, uh, which we believe that it is um, aligned with the global standard in terms of its uh, methodology and um, approaches. It's very comprehensive in terms of their assessments towards the uh, E, S, and G factors because they have a different theme and different pillars when they do their assessments of which tomorrow we'll have a specific, a special, a special session to talk about how FTSE Russell uh, uh, does in terms of their assessments um, towards um, the ESG criteria. And um, in addition to that, we conform our investments with the Sharia list provided by the Securities Commission of Malaysia uh, since that we are a licensed um, Sharia asset management company. So, those are the two our two key areas of uh, data of references for now that we're using and to further manage um the gap we built um internally our monitoring uh, within our investment process and also portfolio modeling um we constantly engage with industry companies on a periodical basis when we meet them during um the um, corporate briefing and also as and when we meet the management of the companies to check on their overall um, ESG ranking um, updates and scoring and um, any major corporate activities that would undermine in terms of their ranking um, status. Um, following which our portfolio exposures in um, ESG are well reflected in our reporting to our investors where they can use um, and have access to the performance review and the reports that we normally um, provide to our uh, investors. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pohesha. I mean, certainly for us, uh, dealing with the equities market, we, we, we're blessed in that sense because there are some agencies that do the ESG rating. In fact, uh, for our viewers out there, uh, tune in tomorrow at 9 for our panel session with F. Fuzi Russell and also Mark. Uh, Malaysian uh, Rating Corporation uh, to talk about ESG in terms of uh, debt raising, uh, the ratings for for debt, uh, people who raise debt uh, in that sense, uh, green bonds and the like. And FTSE Russell, of course, will be talking in terms of the equities market. But from your point of view, Mr. Devendran, I mean, as I said, public uh, space, uh, we, we, we're blessed in terms of this uh, third party uh, ratings provider for ESG, but for the private uh, space, how, how do you see that? I mean, how do you manage that, that uh, data gaps? Yes, so I think the the private space, I think one thing we're very, very focused in terms of what sector you're investing in and what is the intended value creation opportunity really coming out from this, uh, from whatever capital is being uh, deployed. So it's not a broad brush 
uh, machine gun type of approach. Uh, generally, private sector is very snipe. Yeah, they're most snipe like snipers, right? And I mean, so they're very very clear about um, what is the ob objective of capital deployment. And so what really happens there is therefore most most people are able to frame a very specific uh, ESG outcome associated with the capital that's intended to be deployed. So for example, so it's it's like picking a sector allocation, for example, I guess in a in a public uh, environment. But um, and in that case, but but the level of scrutiny is of course much deeper. So I think the benefit of where and where the private sector really plays, and this is something I think we might get to uh, later, hopefully, that the we are able to spend more time now, particularly with management, in terms of getting commitments for them behind this disclosure. So I think one of the tricky parts for public sector start, and this is around, and we might get to data integrity later, but um, not just what data is being provided, but also the level of commitment behind that data. And so I think uh, the, the things that have been happening in the space have been very specific. I mean, you know, for a lot of third party providers now who come in, for example, I think maybe a good, a good reference would be what's happening with the sustainable bonds type of framework. So from the ICMA, you know, the way that we move beyond just, are you a green company? That means, are you doing renewable energy? Tick the box, you know, issue a bond. That it's gone beyond that. Right. So now it's very clear that what exactly is the impact of the money? What are you raising the money for? Let's create some specific targets in terms of what we're expecting to see uh, uh, evolve in the company as a result of the deployment of the capital. And of course, not only are you, not only is this representative of what is, uh, the intention of the company in terms of what it's intending to be responsible for, but now how do you it hold itself accountable? So there are actually measures now being put in and there's a, there's a disincentive framework that now that's now evolved at least in the bond uh, uh, sustainable bond market around you know changing basically coupon disincentives if people if companies and issuers don't meet those targets so there are similar although more complicated and more complex structures uh, obviously as you would, might think in the private uh, sector space uh, but I think the so just to close that off. There's an ability to target this because we're having direct uh, interaction with uh, management, understanding the business, associating the ESG uh, metrics with business value creation, and then you know using that as means uh, using the party data to actually uh, verify some of this. Oh, that's very interesting. So you have a carrot and stick approach, which I, I believe is you know you, it's. It's a very good balance approach la, because you can't just have the carrot without the stick. Uh, that's just yeah. in my personal opinion. But uh, from uh, staying with you, Mr. Devendra, yeah. uh, okay, okay, once you invest in a company, I guess it's much easier to to get uh, the the report for their, their uh, in ESG performance. But what for companies that you are thinking of, of investing, what can you do to encourage uh, those uh, companies where you are you thinking of investing in to report on their ESG performance? Yeah, so yeah, I think the other part view data is actually just the uh, uh, how people are prepared to report uh, on their ESG performance. And I, so I think the most important part here is really around the mindset around uh, ESG adherence. Are you prepared to just uh, you know, do you just look at it from a compliance perspective, or are you really looking at this as something as a internal behavior, and therefore it becomes part and parcel of your brand, right? Uh, but and it's articulated in your organizational ambition. And I think this is the th that it's that part of uh, reporting or disclosure that we pay more attention to. You know, it's not related to the fact that you're just issuing a sustainability report that's consistent with what uh, Bursa reporting guidelines might be. And so I think what we try to work on, uh, particularly with some of our clients in the infrastructure space, is to rethink, for example, your your business model around how you might. So for example, if you're a mini hydro uh, developer or an investor, then how do you start looking at 
you know, just beyond the returns of investing in a renewable energy project, but how do you actually incorporate a, you know, a social aspects? There are, you know, you know, just the basic stuff that used to be in place from the equator principles that used to, be, used to exist for the past 30 years. And there have been new, again, uh, standards in some of these areas that uh, we, that private equity companies have come up with on their own or, you know, have, have adopted from some of the leading players and use those as criteria, you know, ex ante going into the investment and establishing those parameters right up front so that the disclosure then becomes uh, fairly straightforward, you know, uh, uh, before. And obviously, these have, there are financial in, incentives or disincentives. Okay? I think the biggest disincentive is the fact that you just don't get the next round of capital if you don't meet and don't actively promote your, these ambitions, right? Um, because the moment you don't get the next round of capital, uh, that affects your reputation, affects your, not just the ability to achieve your own ambitions, but just your ability to go out and just talk to people again. So, yeah, I mean, what, uh, maybe just uh, just to summarize what you say. So basically for a company, it's in their interest to actually report and and fully adopt this ESG performance because it opens up a larger pool of investors for them, uh, not just from an equity point of view, also from a debt point of view as well. So uh, I guess uh, it is very important for companies uh, to adopt ESG performance given the uh the focus now is on esg investment okay uh next uh next question goes to you Kwan Asha. <clears throat> uh, is an esg view of a company vital for an accurate long-term view yeah the short answer to that is yes Imran. um yep. ESG view generally provides additional lens as i mentioned many times just now for this is for better visibility and also insights of the companies that we invest in um, it reflects on how the management and shareholders of a company view their long-term utilization of resources, their strategic planning, their long-term vision, and also direction um, strategically in terms of how they connect in terms of the whole value chain of the business model as what interestingly uh, shared by Puan Nurul of uh, FGV this morning. Um, it defines their business presence and contribution to their respective um, industry that they are in. And importantly, it explains or prescribes their priorities other than just making uh, profits for the company and to us. Um, this is very crucial in making sure that these companies uh, remain uh, relevant and also sustainable over the long run, um, which is very um, important and imperative in terms of um, deliberating and also um, the sustainability impact is there throughout the whole value chain of the business. Yeah. All right. uh, staying with you, Ponesha. <laughs> we, 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 we stick into the theme of uh, disclosures, uh, data gaps, and you know <clears throat> how company reports their, their, their ESG uh, performances. But uh, I, I don't think anyone wants uh, corporate disclosure just for the sake of uh, disclosure. Uh, I mean, that that's uh, what the field of uh, fields focus on maternity is all about. But of course, uh, the, the some maybe start, some thinking at the moment is that because ESG is quite new, basically it's just a laundry list of uh, issues or maternity. So from your point of view, how do we address the challenge of making sure corporate disclosure focus on what matters rather than just a laundry list of the ESG issues? Yeah. Um... At our end, we strive to focus on creating long-term investment value, uh, which is very crucial. Um, this is through good governance uh, practices within our organization and across our investment companies that we invest in. And we believe that a company that is demonstrating a clear commitment towards delivering um, long-term value should expect uh, ongoing support from its investors. So at MIDF, um, we aim um, to give this support through adopting a consistent, constructive approach in our engagement with uh, companies and taking a long-term view in terms of our uh, strategy approach. Um, to encapsulate that, in a nutshell, we practice what we preach from all levels, starting from ourselves as um, investors, 
and we support our regulators and government in making sure that um, this ESG um, is a prominent uh, feature, a prominent feature uh, for the future. And uh, we will continue to play our roles in our capital markets um, using the Sharia platform as we already have as an additional um, enhancement uh, which are already recognized globally for our uh, Suku presence. Um, we believe that um, this will continue to be an ongoing journey uh, with um, commitments and also support at various um, levels uh, from various stakeholders within the whole ecosystem um, to further um, elevate this, our uh, sustainable agenda. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah please, Mr. Damran, if you want to add to that. Yeah, sorry. Just to close out the thing about disclosure, I think, you know, Kwasha, you made a very valid comment on the fact that disclosure is ultimately really around what are you committing to, right? It's just a very simple thing around that. And I think the in the private sector market, the very sharp uh, end of the stick on this is what is your ambition and what's your roadmap associated with this? And then just being brave enough to hold on both sides as an investor and uh, an investee to that uh, to that ambition and to the, to that commitment because at the end of the day ESG is really about that the governance aspect is that are you prepared not just to be transparent about this but are you prepared to do what's necessary to hold on to that commitment and you know I, I think FGB has done a you know brilliant job in terms of now moving towards how they're going to demonstrate to demonstrate you know and actually manifest in reality what steps they are actively trying to take to make that commitment real right mm -hmm. so i think that that part is just you know just to what's your ambition what's your roadmap that's and and that would i think help us start getting around the fact that we're spending a lot of time around uh have you got data standards have you got all those uh, sort of things no it's just a simple disclosure now are you prepared every year to just come out and say very clearly this is my esg ambition this is what we prepared uh, this is our roadmap now and you know just, and generally as well, I think from the investor community, just be prepared to accept that there will be slips and there may be even, you know, that people may take a leadership problem and, and move ahead faster than this. But this is not about penalizing people. It's about understanding what that what it takes to get that journey going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ramesh made this point about the incremental change. Uh, absolutely important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I also want to earlier from what Mr. Ramesh mentioned earlier uh, on that corporates should take this lead. And then uh, as um, we um, heard from FGV that they have done this, and then when we want to see more of the corporates are taking lead in shifting this paradigm shift to move to the next level from where we are now moving mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Kwasha. Uh, Mr. Devendran. Uh, I mean, certainly it's, uh, yeah, corporates can do more and we hope that corporates can do more in the future in terms of not just uh, disclosure, disclosure that what's matter, but uh, maybe going to you, Mr. Devendran, uh, following up from this, how do you see sustainable investing principle affect a company besides just the disclosure or anything else? Yeah, so I think like, uh, you know, using that, it's a paradigm shift is always like a nice cliche thing that transformation people want to talk about and you know strategy people want to sell a consulting service on but the i think the that the, we are part you know coming out of the financial crisis particularly exacerbated by the current the sort of global pandemic issues with the covid 19 pandemic but um so i think why where we are at now is that we've moved beyond Initially, you know, our whole economy was a utility-based economy. You know, how effective and efficient uh, is our ability to produce and utilize uh, resources, right? And that was pretty much what drove our, in, in the third industrial revolution sort of thing. But now, if we are moving forward, it's not just the experience economy, which is what's driving social media, the, the digitalization, the kind of social experiences so you can see how much value is being created out of experiences, right? The fact that, you know, the number of people are just watching what's happening with SpaceX, you know, they're not participating, 
they're actively involved in the construction, but my God, they all feel that they are part of this journey to Mars, right? And you're watching what's, what's happening there. And so that, that experience economy is really driving lots of things now, behavior of consumers right, uh, and consumer patterns. Um, but the other part now, and I think uh, where we look at from a net zero value creation perspective is really that value is going to be created by three things. One, who is going to buy your experience? Mm -hmm. Two, who are the, where's the talent going to be coming from to create that experience for you? And where, what are the resource providers, both from supply chain and capital, who are actually going to be able to want to be part of that journey? So that is what's critical now. And what, what I think it's beyond this term about is sustainable investing the right thing to do. It is the way we have to act. It is who we have to be now. Having, without this ambition, right, you will not, I mean, there's been a significant transfer of wealth already from the baby boomer market to these people who are looking at sustainable experiences as key outcomes for their own livelihood. So now this is just an imperative. It's not a question of whether or not you can choose to be nice or not. You have to have the right attitude, right? And yeah, start looking at an attitude for choosing to do the right things is what I think is most important now. Oh, very interesting. So basically, from from that, I gather that ESG is basically what you say is holistic. It's not just about the products. Uh, so companies should also look at the people. Uh, you know, if in order to attract the right people, the right talent, they also have to look at ESG as well. Because most likely the millennials, this future workforce, they're very much into that. And of course, uh, the capital that you attract, uh, we, we already touched upon that. <clears throat> very much dependent because uh, uh, investors are continuously looking at uh, ESG investing now. So uh, maybe we can go a little bit on the future of, of, of uh, ESG in that sense. Maybe we start with now, and, and this goes to both of you, uh, whoever wants to speak first uh, can just do so. What was the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on sustainable investing in your view? Uh, should I start first? Um, sure, sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was an um, obvious positive impact, of course. And um, we see there's a strong correlation between the two. COVID-19 um, outbreak has um, undoubtedly accelerated greater demand for sustainable investing like um, never before, like we haven't seen before. We believe it will um, continue to be positive um, moving forward. Um, this is anchored by the fact that we do not have a choice, as you mentioned just now, Mr. Dave, that um, this is coming um, as a result of it because of the uh, structural change and also permanent shift in terms of demand and attitude um, that we're seeing um, in the horizon. And um, in actual fact, we see growing demand for ESG funds uh, with um, net inflows of more than or close to two US dollar, two trillion within this space uh, during this pandemic um, period since last year. And we strongly believe that ESG teams are not only um, in part from a financial investment perspective, but it affects our livelihood. It's about how we lead our daily lives, um, the way we conduct uh, in terms of our lives moving forward. So in uh, encapsulate the whole sum. And we think that it will be inevitable um, and only uh, for a matter of time, uh, this will take us through um, for that matter. We believe on the notion that charity should begin at home, as um, we always say that. And um, as such, we always, uh, we are put our money where the mouth, our mouth is. This is through our uh, recent launch of uh, a domestic ESG Sharia equity fund our first um, sustainable responsible fund that we just launched uh, uh, just launched last Friday on the 18th of June. It's called MIDF Amana ESG Mustadama or in short MEEM fund. Um, um, Mustadama uh, sounds Arabic um, to reflect that it is um, a Sharia uh, fund which means um, the ability to sustain 
And the launch, uh, the launch of this fund uh, is not only to expand our pool of um, offerings, but it also acts as a conduit to further improve the breadth and depth of our domestic capital markets. That's what we're seeing. Um, because this niche fund is our um, for our investment in our local equity markets um, that is based on the Tusi for Good Bursa Malaysia Sharia companies. And um, we see a growing demand um, evidence by the growth in terms of the numbers uh, of companies that are listed um, under the FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Index, which um, started with only 24 constituents at the beginning and has um, improved to 75 um, as of the latest. And this further support our belief and conviction that the rate of growth in this segment will continue to be uh, for the benefit of um, local listed companies, our capital markets as a whole, and most importantly, for a better green Malaysia. We hope that this fund uh, would provide an impactful and sustainable value proposition uh, for investors that have their priority more than just financial gains. But in another word, um, it's a combination of impactful and sustainable investing that we aim to deliver and also achieve for our investors. Um, we will have a session at a later after this um, that will be uh, presented uh, by our head of business development, Inchi Azlan, who will share more insights in terms of um, the, 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 the newest, uh, the latest launch of our fund. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pasha. L certainly looking forward to sign up and invest in your fund. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank we you. look at uh, for that. Um, Mr. Devendran, from from your side, from, from your view, yeah. what was the yeah, I'm, I'm conscious about, yeah, I'm conscious about the time and then just keeping opportunity for questions. Um, but yeah. I think maybe I'll just take it. Look, clearly the COVID nineteen, I think, was uh, situation is uh, Berkeley made it very obvious and it just created a burning platform for what was, I think, already inherent in people in terms of thinking around what do we do to be more responsible around uh, the kind of investments, the kind of business that we're doing. So I think impact is the key word. People now need to focus on what is the impact that they're really having, what is the impact that they actually want to commit to, and how are we building a community of impact for that. So almost every company has got to really think about the experiences, impact experience that they're creating for their tribe, for their brand, right? And um, and I think that's what's really, uh, you know, sort of uh, been given a kick uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, <laughs> yeah. to get everybody moving uh, on this. So, uh, and, and that's really good because I think almost, you know, 100% of the funds that were raised in the infrastructure space uh, and it would be significant. It would be about twenty to thirty billion raised uh, U.S. dollars raised, you know, just in the last sort of six months ish of uh, twenty twenty, and then uh, leading into twenty twenty one as well with an accelerated focus. And almost all of that has been going towards, you know, that it must target a climate outcome, must have ESG factors uh, in it, uh, you know, and com uh, companies or the investee companies are. Uh, expected to adhere to an ESG transition or program or an ESG roadmap. So this is just, you know, the way things are now. And uh, and I think for for what we are excited about here is that there's, there's this huge space. I think, you know, uh, again, as, 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 as was discussed partly in the FDB presentation, the supply chain side, right, just getting the essential infrastructure in place for this shift. How do we think about you know, new investments in water treatment, in waste treatment, in supply chain logistics. How do we think about, you know, electric vehicles as part of public mobility? You know, how does personal mobility work as well in terms of whether, you know, scooters work, you know, whatever it is, but there are huge changes. And I think this presents an amazing opportunity for our country in terms of how we might set a new agenda moving forward. So, you know, the, we had Vision 2020 that galvanized a lot of us. In some ways, you know, we, you know, people can say different things about it, and I'm not going to get into the political arguments around it. But the fact of matter that it it sort of set an ambition that you know this is going to be a country that's going to be developed. You know, a, 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 we have a development a, a target. So now, but you know, can we set this net zero ambition as something that we want to move forward on, right? And how do we start putting 
that infrastructure together and start investing uh, with that focus in mind. All right, thanks. Uh, actually, we, uh, I've been told uh, by the floor manager that we, we, we have ample time to take okay. questions as well. <laughs> and since the, uh, this conversation seems to be, uh, you know, running quite quite well, uh, quite an interesting topic as well. We have a few questions. Before I go to my, my final question, maybe I'll, I'll save that for, for yeah. the final thoughts. Uh, we'll go to some of the questions that have been posted by our viewers. Uh, maybe I'll ask this to you first, uh, Mr. Devendran. Yeah. Uh, what can uh, developing or emerging markets like Malaysia learn from the experience from developed markets in facilitating capital flows to sustainable development? Uh, equally, on the flip side, what are the possible pitfalls that we should avoid? Uh, and maybe I'll just uh, throw this in as well. Of the three dimension of ESG, which dimension is still a legat in Malaysia? Uh, interesting question. So I, I think, um, like with anything else, the danger is just simply, you know, a copy paste type uh, approach. You know, so mm -hmm. oh, you know, there's a there's an ambition to set, uh, you know, global car carbon targets, and then how do we uh, catch up with this? So I, th I think there are different aspects of uh, investing in Malaysia, at least from our perspective. One of the critical things is clearly there are companies which are global leaders, right? Uh, and participate in a global, uh, able to discuss, you know, the likes of Petronas, FGV, Saim uh, mm -hmm. you know, clearly are organizations that operate at a global scale and therefore are able to, I think, incorporate, uh, their ESG maturity is at a different level. But as was mentioned in the FGV uh, discussion, a lot, a vast majority of the, in the Malaysian economy, significant employment is created through SMEs. And these companies do, generally don't have the resource capacity or really what I refer to as reflective capacity. So they don't have that time because every day they are hustling to get money in the door to be able to make sure they can make their commitments for payments to, of salaries and other things, right? So there's a very high hustle factor, very low reflective uh, opportunity. So to be able to really think about how they want to change. And I think what is really important now is to, for, for, for capital providers, the large capital markets, not just to look at what's happening in the public security. So listed companies are one thing, but the, you know, how does, uh, EPF, how does, you know, some of the other products, Kazana and others start looking at saying, how do we manage ESG transitions, this net zero transition now as a critical fact in terms of how we want to move forward. That I think is absolutely essential in terms of putting the, the underlying infrastructure in space. You know, it's going back to the old days of opening the West. If you don't put the money in the railroads or in just the roads and in the horses or in the telegram channel, you know, those sort of things, then nothing else can be built on top of it. So we are at that sort of stage. The ESG infrastructure, particularly built around our medium-sized type companies, I think this is critical. That that engine, and that's why we are focused on. So we're not, you know, we we look across a few places. So we're looking at raising a, a fund at the moment to invest in uh, ESG infrastructure. What we're referring to as ESG infrastructure, and this is basically infrastructure that helps achieve a climate target or helps improve pollution outcomes or help even improve social outcomes, right? And, but we're looking at medium scale in infrastructure. It's the piece that is left out uh, of this because the public sector sees the large uh, companies, the private sector tends to get channeled in silos. And so it depends on what happens to be the flavor of the day. And if we only choose to value business based on corporate finance 101, <laughs> right? Which basically says discount rates on the back of money or on a spreadsheet. Now, how do you capture this new value elements, right? Uh, uh, and, that, and then those things need to come in. And that's, that's what we hope to be able to play so we can change how we think about capital liquidity in this space, focus around building the essential infrastructure. I mean, definitely, uh, you touch upon corporate finance 101 in terms of valuation. Yeah, maybe there's, there should be a paradigm shift in terms of how you value a company to incorporate ESG practices inside there as well. And 
I, I firmly believe that uh, we need to educate our future financiers, future uh, workers, future research analysts, future investors as well, in terms of value, incorporating this uh, ESG into the valuation model uh, that is, has been taught uh, in universities and the like. Uh, from uh, moving on to, to you, Panesha. Uh, okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll put in two questions at once. Uh, okay, one question is, with the focus on carbon emissions and climate change, is there any danger of fossil fuel energy projects to be deprived of financing? How capital markets can help balance between the need for powering economic growth and managing climate change? And then lastly, ESG can be interpreted in so many ways. Are we likely to see convergence in operating metrics being looked at at the global level anytime soon? Yeah, um, you are rightly putting um, the um, Imran and also thank you for the question coming from the floor. Um, as I can share in terms of the um, reporting by the companies, we could see that um, in terms of the companies that are uh, putting disclosure or having disclosure in terms of the carbon emission also we could see that they're still lacking about 40 percent of the corporates um, are still uh, lacking in terms of um, putting or having disclosure in terms of how they deploy in terms of their practices in addressing the climate change in terms of the carbon emission and also um, issues pertaining to the um, environmental um, issues within the E element um, of the assessments. So that is still lacking. Um, but I think I believe that um, various um, corporates and also um, SMEs has have taken measures also to elevate um, this need to make sure to making sure that uh, these elements are available, especially from the global front. And then I must say that in terms of the um, assessment, in terms of the E, S, and G governance probably probably the strongest um, element that we have uh, in Malaysia because um, it has been strong or uh, long enough for us uh, where there's a lot of this available data and also um, information about the G element. But then in terms of the environmental and also the social part, which are still relatively uh, new to us, um, which there's along the pipeline uh, in terms of the upgrades and also how we are uh, in terms of the corporates and also the players would need to elevate further in terms of how we assess and also view um, in terms of assessing all this E and also the um, S element within the ESG to make sure that we are also at par and also in terms of the standard, um, the global standard, meeting the global standard um, in, in general. Yeah, that's my uh, view on that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paisha. Imran, just, just Sorry. Up, there was a question around uh, deprivation of capital towards fossil fuel, yeah. yeah, right? Oh, yeah. Exactly. yeah, look, I think, I think that's probably a nice problem <laughs> as a result of this in, that, in the sense that, look, if it's almost a function of the fact that things are moving in a, a direction. Now, I, I guess the fundamental question is that, do we still need a certain amount of uh, fossil fuel in our mix as we transition into this? Because we are, I think coming back to your question already, can we just copy paste things from uh, Europe, for example, into this? We are not, we are still, you know, we, we still look at co-generation, whereas, you know, in Europe, if you try to raise capital for a co-generation product, people just laugh at you. You know, they, they've moved beyond that already because they're, they've really, I mean, the, the, the value base for the economy has shifted beyond this so that they can make those, the next level investments in, uh, you know, level five versions of uh, renewable energy. Whereas we still have to get through that transition. We have to significantly move away from our coal base. And that's not going to fundamentally change because unfortunately that's the investments we've made. Right? It's an investment we've made for 40 years. And so our ability to slowly move there out so that we don't, uh, so we don't have a, a capital market uh, disturbance associated with this, because there are real issues associated with that, particularly in our debt capital markets. But the fact of the matter is that if you're looking into the future now, uh, 
You know, I've I've seen a you know recent uh, corporate finance corporate deals where people have been trying to get investors to look at portfolios that were heavy fossil fuel centric, and the level of interest is you know <laughs> almost zero. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. So yeah. you want to add these to their portfolio, the likes of you know the large, larger organizations. You know, look at Tanaga National's uh, growth ambitions. You look at where Petronas is headed. You know, you can very clearly see the direction is moving towards the fact that yes, capital. Uh, cheap capital will uh, has moved away completely, right? Mm -hmm. It's completely moved away. In fact, there's a complete lack of capital in some of these traditional fossil fuel areas. But if you can be smart about utilization of gas, you know, and doing other things, then there's probably a transition to renewable energy. I think the biggest uh, opportunity in Malaysia is the transition on the consumption side. How people start thinking about how they consume electricity, how they can be self uh, generators on their own how do we create the regulatory environment and i think this is going to be absolutely critical because one of the key things that's limiting the ability for the smes and smaller industries to move is the fact that there is still a very uh, uh controlled regulatory environment that doesn't allow participation so for example with with some of the solar incentives and things that are working for smaller plants of so rooftop solar and others there's there's still restrictions while there are technical limitations obviously in terms of connecting generators to the grid but there are i think there are ways in which we can start encouraging and the government's done a fantastic job ready to put moving making the first step possible but if we can start opening up some of these things then then i think we'll start getting the capital moving in the right direction and enable people to not focus on doing the right uh, projects and forget about these fossil fuel projects yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, maybe uh, we're talking about maybe one or two more questions. Uh, maybe this one goes to, to you again, Mr. Devendran. Sure. How does social entrepreneurship fit into the current financial system? Is it considered a good investment? If so, who are supporting them? Right, social entrepreneurship. Um, yeah, so I think coming back to this question, Question around, I think, what what is your uh, in terms of the social targets that you might set uh, for for new investments? I think this, this is critical because um, focusing on uh, social uh, uh, entrepreneurship is a I, I think a lot of the private sector um, investments are really focused on trying to figure out how do we how do we include other businesses that are focused on achieving social outcomes as part of our portfolio uh, allocation? I think that is that is something that we are. I think people are still trying to understand: is the social aspect purely a charitable enterprise, or is it something that we can now incorporate as part of our value considerations in terms of how we should be building our business? I think we haven't figured out the value metrics associated with social in social outcomes we what has happened i think now as i as i mentioned earlier i said there are three key areas in terms of how you think about value creation one is what is the target you want to achieve second is what are these enablers so what is the social activity that helps you build your organization so that you can mm. create value so and i think that, that is the bit that we need to change our valuation models so that we can, we, we don't just, because in order to move away from money, we have to start valuing the social exchange that creates economic value. Mm. And this is the problem. This is a critical problem. And I've spent, you know, as I moved away a little bit from corporate and spent a couple, uh, spent some years over the last two, three years on social enterprises, looking at charities and other one of their critical problems is that they don't have a business model, a valuation model for the social exchange. They, mm. they create a lot of hard value, but mm. unfortunately that value is not translatable into monetary value. So how mm. do you value? I think the big question here, simple terms, is how do you value the decision of a single mom to stay at home and take care of her kids? And what mm. are you prepared to do as society to make that happen? Yeah. Because it, that 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 decision is the most important thing that needs to happen, not to get her to have to go out and cook 
or sell some products so that she has to earn an income, then she can pay for this. And all that does is create a higher cost because every hour or second she's taken time away from investing in that ability for a child, at least given them the opportunity to grow, is value taken away from the economy. Yeah. How do you incorporate that? How, yes. how do you incorporate that um, subjectivity in terms of yeah, uh, into your business model um, right. today? That's, yeah. Right. And so the ability to do that, I think, is what's critical. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of people will do some really good work in terms of trying to figure out how we can create that kind of value. And then I think these social enterprises will have the right models to create value going forward. Okay. Uh, maybe one last question uh, for you, or a couple of que questions for you, Ponesha. Uh, I guess we already touched this, but maybe you can give some uh, a little bit more color. <laughs> we, uh, you said that we use FTSE Russell, a benchmark from uh, FTSE Russell and uh, Bursa's, uh, Br sorry, FTSE Russell, uh, FTSE for Good Index, sorry. Yeah. Uh, besides that, is there any other benchmarks used uh, by maybe by yourself or from the industry that you know uh, to determine if uh, firms are meeting the SG requirements? And then lastly, maybe from... Uh, a bit of an advice somebody is asking whether i mean embracing esg is effective if it's a top down uh, in a company basically driven by the, the management but how do you have any advice for subordinates to push uh, esg embracement uh, from a bottom up uh, point of view yeah um okay coming back to the first question whether there's another source of reference that we can use right um, at this point, um, um, there's various um, sources uh, available um, in the market. For instance, other than FTSE Russell, there's Sustainalytics, there's uh, Bloomberg also provide um, all these um, sustainable or responsible um, assessments. But then for us, um, when um, we uh, adopt this, we um, choose to use uh, FTSE Russell um, because we believe that in terms of the methodology and approaches that are uh, um, conducted or uh, deployed by uh, FUSI Russell is in line with the global standard. So that is why in terms of the credential and also the um, the integrity of the data um, that FUSI Russell provides us, uh, we believe in that. So for now, uh, we strongly believe that FUSI Russell will be able to provide us in terms of that reference. Um, and in terms of the fundamental uh, bottoms up and also top down approach, um, when we build our modeling, uh, when we do our assessment in terms of portfolio construction, we take into consideration um, the macro analysis, which we look also from the sector and also the uh, micro dynamic uh, of the companies that we invest in. And then, of course, at that, uh, we also take into consideration the bottom up approach in terms of looking at the financial modeling, as, as I mentioned just now, looking at the um, the data, the ROEs, the normal um, NTA earnings, and also the uh, dividend yield, um, return on capitals for the companies. And in addition to that, we believe that integration of ESG will provide uh, an overlay to further assess in terms of the other risk metrics, to further support in terms of our bottom up um, analysis. Of course, we believe that uh, corporates also in terms of um, enhancing their practices in doing this to so making sure that rather than just um, delivering or providing good um, return or financial results, it's important also for them to really, really look from the E, S and G elements to make sure that the business model are relevant for the long term over the long run. And then uh, we see that this um, their business model uh, remain um, relevant uh, years down the road. So, to us, it's very important for, um, uh, for for investors to have that assessment in place and also um, to make sure that it's a value creation along the way. Uh, when we invest in, there's value creation and also um, return to be made um, in addition to having ESG investment, uh, ESG assessments in place. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Pasha. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll ask this. Okay, sure, please. Just, just a couple of things. One, 
I think from the private uh, equity side of things, I think it's really important for people, uh, and this goes to both sides of the question, one, what is the kind of information out there? People should start looking at what's happening with, you know, the principles of uh, behind sustainable bonds, for example, the ICMA framework for, for sustainable bonds that really gives a lot of exposure to uh, how you start thinking about including and incorporating uh, ESG factors into uh, funds, uh, you know, fundraising activities. And that, you know, starts, I think, doing so private equity reports, the, you know, the likes of BlackRock, uh, some of the leading organizations, even looking at, you know, sustainalytics, just yeah, uh, some of the disclosures are coming out of uh, Morningstar and others on ESG, being familiar with those things. So not just, you know, taking it easy and saying, I'm just going to follow an ESG index. That's, you know, and I, and I don't think that's what Kwan Aisha is actually saying. She's very clear that, look, these, these uh, indicators actually provide a lot of very deep information around how the analysis, how you should reframe your mind, reframe your thinking around ESG factors and the principles for responsible in investment, for example, coming out of the UN. And so following these sort of things, the ICMA framework, principles for responsible investment and some of the leading private equity guys that will give you real good color in terms of how you might really want to think about what your disclosure should be. And I think it's going to be the fact that people need to start. It's not about what standard should I follow, but I think that is just the wrong mindset. You need to start figuring out what is the right engine for yourself. What is the heart that you really want to build in your engine? And that is going to be your ESG consciousness. The other thing coming back to what can you do, right, as a, as a person, I think as this putting on my organizational hacktivist hat. <laughs> so it's a personal thing. I think ultimately there are three things that we all focus on in terms of any community or organization. It's the actions. This is my ABC for organizations. It's the actions that we want to head out on the behavior that we need to have and the capability that we need to have to, in order to make that happen. So if these three things now we need to focus on, can we achieve that in our current organization or can we affect it in our community or can we do it with our friends and family, right? There will be an ESG opportunity available out there. It's available now and for everyone. It's just, are we prepared to do something about it? And when we start stepping into it, as Ramesh said, there will be that incremental change. And we need to start with that. Just what are we prepared to do as a family, right? If we can't control our bosses, then <laughs> we yeah. potentially are a boss of something. And if you're yeah. not, then you've got a bigger, you've got a bigger problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean, to go on to your point there, uh, just a bit of a plug for tomorrow's event, we, we are uh, inviting an NGO, Seed Malaysia, that yeah. Uh, he, will, he will talk about how we as individual, not as an organization, but we as an individual can help uh, to accelerate this ESG adoption. Uh, basically, all, every little help matter. The idea behind this is every little help matters. So if everyone takes small baby steps, this will accumulate into bigger steps for the country. So if you're viewing this, please tune in tomorrow as well. And of course, we we are having uh, Futsi Russell. Just uh, to remind again, we're having Futsi Russell and Mark, uh, so you can see how the thinking behind uh, putting an ESG ratings and the, and the like, the analysis behind it, uh, will be talked about much further. So, okay, last question before we end. I know we're having fun here uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, in this chat we're having, but uh, you know we have to make do for the next uh, speaker. Just one last question. Maybe I'll throw this to Ponasha first. Uh, it's the same question, but with Ponasha, a little bit different. There's a little bit uh, additional questions uh, being put there as well. So for Ponasha, what are the main challenges to the continued growth of sustainable investing? And uh, this is specific question for this for you. Why so little ESG fund in Malaysia? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, the first question, Imran, it's about um, the challenges that we're seeing. Um, it's about having the right um, mindset, I would say. Sustainable and responsible agenda is, um, as we see, is a, truly a journey. Um, that's what we see. Um, it's a collective commitment uh, required and also responsibilities to push, uh, to push this together. We, we, see, we still see the gaps and in terms of disclosure, lack of uniformity and standard of reporting across various industries um, due to adoption of different practices. 
nevertheless, uh, we believe a, a vibrant and sustainable ecosystem is very much um, needed in, in this sense. Um, this will be supported by a more proactive role by the respective uh, players to drive this sustainable agenda forward, which we do see is happening uh, as we were deliberating and discussed this now. We started at some point and we have um, shifted um, positively, progressively, and we hope this um, to continue um, through building awareness and continuous um, engage engagement um, at various um, levels, as I mentioned earlier on. And um, at MIDF, as alluded by our group managing director, Datuk Sharon, this morning, also during his this um, his um, opening remark this morning at MIDF group, we have fully embraced this journey and moving towards green financing. Also, as stated by Datuk, responsible lending and sustainable investing are the way forward. So this is um, it's in the DNA across the group. Uh, from a group-wide perspective. It's a holistic approach altogether. At MIDF, I said, we have embarked on this journey when we became fully Sharia in the year of 2018. And the launch of this new fund, our first ESG fund, marked another milestone and uh, for us and more to come, inshallah. Our CEO, Inchit Sani, has been driving this sustainable, responsible um, agenda, investing full-heartedly with full commitment. Uh, with dedicated team across the group uh, that we have, that we're seeing. And we are grateful. Um, it's my sincere gratefulness to see that we have a very supportive board uh, who, who have made all this journey possible. And as a portfolio manager, as portfolio managers, we the team, when we decide to invest today in a solid fundamental stock, we expect to see value creation that is very important. Uh, we want to see a business model that remain relevant years down the road, years to come. That requires commitments by the corporates, all the innovation and also greater commitments um, at various levels within the ecosystem. And um, that, as I mentioned, also affects the whole value chain and also the overall um, ecosystem in terms of how um, businesses conduct their business model the way in terms of the way they do their strategic thinking and also the vision, the mission going forward for the future, for the sustainability of the business. And I believe that um, together we can do this at professional levels and also personal levels and bring this to a greater height, um, inshallah. And then coming back to the, the second question, why we still see um, in terms of the ESG fund is still uh, lacking. Yes, I think, I believe that um, it's growing, even though there's not much as compared to the other conventional funds that are, are available in the market, especially the domestic ESG space, um, as fund managers are now rather focused on uh, going abroad and do a global fund. But then we believe that with various efforts and also commitments taken by um, at all levels, this initiative will sift through, will continue to be at a greater level, given that we have seen in terms of the demand attraction from the millennials also, um, it's getting higher in terms of their concerns and also their awareness and also their need and also they are very intrigued in terms of having more of this um, set of funds and also this theme um, within the uh, investment um, community and also the offerings. So uh, on that note, um, we see it's growing, even though um, there's a lot of um, room for improvement as what we can see. But then um, I think with the awareness and also this uh, commitment to do this at all levels, we can um, push this further, inshallah. Inshallah, thank you very much for Nesha. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Devendran, your last thought. What are the main challenges to the, the continued growth of sustainable investing? Yeah, so I think if you, if you talked about the fact that there's a very limited, uh, you know, ESG funds on the public security side of things, but, you know, in the private sector, that's even worse. 
right? Um, and and I think this again comes back to what we talked about earlier, which is one uh, a basis for valuation. So one of the critical things I think is can the investment community start talking about really about ESG integrated value, right? In a in from a different perspective. So for example, one of the key challenges would be how do we make ESG value a number one topic on your research report going forward in run, right? That's it, research, right? Come on. How do we make that the number one thing, right? Not not the financial statement. Guess what? You know, this is how they progress because that's what you see straight away on the any analyst report. And that needs to change, right? Because if if that we, we don't bring that social exchange, like what are the underlying parameters, right? Uh, that actually are driving value and bring that right up to the front, right? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, okay, then yeah, you see, so you treat financial results as a result. It's an outcome. It's an after the fact observation of some some initial behavior. Uh, Charlie Munger has been associated with this thing about show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. As long as we keep investing for money, right? And I mean, that will not change, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. we have to start. Uh, I think making people aware of how does investment, how does deployment, how do people translate, create the social exchange for money, for value creation, and allow that story. So I think that narrative needs to come out very clearly in some way. I think the other part is uh, we need in the alternative investment space, it's a major challenge in Malaysia in terms of how can we think about uh, the, the funds that are allocating capital to uh, to alternative investments, how are they rethinking their approach to uh, investments? I think that's that's absolutely critical because we have a very standard model, unfortunately, about how we're investing in infrastructure uh, by just following the standard models uh, around place, and that's something that we need to think about moving forward. So that's that's a major challenge uh, for you know uh, EPF and some of the other you know. Uh, funds like Kazama. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Devendran. Uh, thank you very much, Panesha, for sharing your thoughts today. I mean, we we uncover a lot, but I think this is a subject that can be continuously talked. It's good that uh, a lot of people are starting this conversation. I think we're, we're at least for Malaysia, we're moving into the the, the right direction. Some uh, some, if you may uh, allow me to just summarize what we talk about. We talk about how ESG, we cannot uh, cut and paste from the Western side because we are still developing. It has to be an incremental approach. But companies should look at ESG holistically because it's not just about the product. It's about your future workforce. It's about the capital you're going to attract. Uh, and this also leads to the need for education. The need to, to develop a, a new valuation model incorporating ESG. Uh, I take up your challenge, Mr. Devendran, as head of research. That's one thing that we're looking at: how to incorporate ESG into our our reports. Uh, yeah, I mean, with the big data gaps and everything like that, we're still working on it. Hopefully, we can have something uh, in the near future. It's a pleasure to to speak to both of you. Uh, we hope to see you again uh, in uh, another session in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Devendran. Thank you very much, Puan No Aisha. I hope you have a good day and a good week ahead and uh, please stay safe. Uh, with that, I thank you. I conclude the panel session and over to you, Amelia. Thank you very much. Well, Bye. Well, thanks, thanks a lot to you and Amelia for arranging this. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for everyone. Thank you very much. Take care. All right, uh, now let's give a moment for our next speaker to dial in.
Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we are now uh, on our last segment of today's webinar. Let's welcome our final speaker, Encik Aslan Azizuddin, the Vice President and the Head of Business Development at MIDF Amana Asset Management Berhad. Encik Aslan will be sharing his insights into the domestic ESG sharing of fund. Over to you, Encik Aslan. Okay, thank you. Uh, just let me share my screen for a while. Just a second. Um, can't seem to get it on my thing. There seems to be a bit of a lag, yeah? So, excuse me. Uh, to get into Imran, sorry about the slight delay. Uh, can you get uh, Sidek to share the slides on my behalf? Be great. I know it's almost lunch. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Salam alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. It is with great pleasure uh, to welcome all of our speakers, panelists, and attendees to this webinar on ESG and you. Yeah, uh, we at MDF Asset Management are thoroughly honored by your attendance and uh, also to be given the opportunity to introduce our newly launched unit trust product named MDF Amana ESG Muftadama Fund. I know it's a bit of a, a lengthy. Uh, name for a fund. Uh, however, uh, in short, it's M A. E M, uh, and it was constituted uh, on the 3rd of May and launched on the 18th of June 2021. Yes, it was last Friday, still hot off the press, and it's also been managed by uh, uh, Puan, uh, by us, uh, MDF and Asset Management, uh, and Puan Aisha and her team, uh, uh, our CIO, uh, the managed by, by, by her team as well. If I may draw attention to your presentation slide, uh, it is obvious that the general uh, theme for the fund is ESG and Sharia. I think the next question would be, uh, what does Mustadama mean? Uh, the answer, linguistically, uh, is in the Arabic root word of Mustadama, meaning sustainable and ability. Yeah. And if combined both, uh, is pronounced as ability to sustain. Hence, uh, we believe in the core management uh, style of MAEM -M -A -E fund, uh, it is instantly embedded in the fund principle of income, growth, and stable portfolio performance. I believe the general concept, uh, uh, next slide please. I believe the general concept of, uh, 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 I believe the general concept of ESG is a hot topic of day and has been discussed uh, widely across all financial institutions, especially in Malaysia, and since 2014, actually. Uh, it is discussed more so now, uh, especially during this COVID-19 crisis. I will generally talk about the, uh, the ESG principles adopted by the fund and investment concept practiced by the fund managers, uh, but we have the ESG eccentric uh, Sharia as a core fundamental screening process. Uh, if you don't mind going to slide two, please. What is ESG in context of stability, uh, of, of, of portfolio stability? Uh, we believe that ESG investing will provide a sustainable investment platform based on this, all these three main, main factors, which is environment, 
uh, social impact and government and governance based on each esg scoring our fund managers will be able to track and measure the sustainability factor of each local company as part of the portfolio selection uh, and their strategy moving forward if we start with e uh, the environment uh, if you look at majority of companies who are waste polluters uh, greenhouse emission uh, you know that, that they do de deforestation their businesses don't last long um, as we notice especially especially when it comes to uh, listed companies because it will all be picked up by investors no matter how you try to uh, mask it as something else in terms of social responsibility invest investing we noticed that uh, recently even uh, when you don't take care of your employees uh, when there's uh, your working conditions are bad uh, yeah it will be uh, we pick up by the press and automatically uh, your ESG scoring will definitely drop. Hence, we see the need for more social responsibility invest investing, especially when it comes to working conditions, uh, housing uh, for the locals that would not promote uh, uh, further deterioration in terms of uh, uh, business uh, business bottom lines. And the last one that we look at is the governance. And of course, uh, if there's corruption, uh, if, there, if, if there's uh, lobbying for uh, the projects to go on despite it being bad for the environment uh it it does uh it does bring out uh, and, and and nowadays uh you can see is it's it's, it's it's in the public everybody knows what you're doing it's been reported so definitely uh when we look at this all these factors esg if you are if you are in that constituent which Prove this, uh, then we know your company would last uh, for, for for a longer uh, period of time instead of just uh, of the uh, fly by our companies uh, that we have seen uh, recently. Uh, there's a certain engine that's, that's going on. Um, as we move on to the next slide, uh, we at MDI believe not only ESG is in. Uh, not, not, not only ESG practices can provide sustainability investment solution, as Juan Aisha has mentioned uh, earlier in slide. We also believe that there is a material impact on the return portfolio uh, profile of the portfolio. And we also believe uh, with this ESG component being in our portfolio, we believe uh, we can sort of mitigate the long-term risk uh, of the of all investment portfolios that we see going forward, especially when it, when it involves ESG. Uh, if we have uh, increasing interest of local listed companies could also provide more stock selection for a, diversified, uh, a more diversified portfolio in the future. It is a material, it, the, the material impact is definitely would invite more variety of participants herding for investment funds investing in this company. You know, you get all these funds, uh, if, if you don't have, is a, is a, is a, a cat and mouse story, when you don't have enough uh, funds, the companies won't. Uh, the uh, ESG is not a priority. So if the bigger the fund pool is, uh, who's interested in investing in ESG, so then we see more uh, uh, more companies attracted to this uh, ESG component. Where uh, we see going forward, inshallah, that more more and more participants will actually create more funds. You know, create more. Uh, 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 uh awareness in this uh, so that uh going forward the, the future would definitely be um uh, uh a, a category of of itself yeah so uh if if if, if we see it also that uh, we also see the esg standards would definitely provide a level of due diligence as we would see it would definitely weed out unsustainable companies applying outdated practices and harmful side effects. The global standards and scrutinization imposed would definitely minimize uh, risk for investors as companies evolve into a more responsible entity with greater likelihood of succeeding in the long run. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, slide five, uh, we are inviting all participants here uh, to view and consider our investment ideas reflected in our new product offering. Below, uh, if, if you see in the slides, there are the five uh, key pillars of which we know would satisfy retail investors looking for sustainability. Of course, uh, if you talk about uh, investors out there, the, the, their main uh, concern would be uh, how much do I get for my investment? Yeah. So. Uh, this absolute uh, return portfolio, we are targeting of annual return of six percent. Yeah, uh, this is uh, estimated. Uh, this, this, the estimation is based on our back testing 
uh, model uh, of three years, and uh, the results were convincing as we applied um, as, as we applied the equal weighted uh, equal weighted asset allocation as a strategy. Yeah, our investments are definitely Sharia, so uh, they are pretty stable. As, as, as you can see, uh, and it's screened by SE. We fully support the local ESG initiative as a uh, as a domestic fund. Uh, where we believe the charity should begin at home. So as awareness of ESG increases and local institutions and funds uh, participation gathers momentum, means more initiatives uh, from the private and the government sector. Then hence we, we could drive this uh, ESG agenda forward. Yeah, and the recent pandemic has shown that uh, if it's a portfolio built on uh, ESG and sharing, uh, uh, they're more uh, resilient uh, when it comes to downside risk. Uh, yeah, so we believe these are these are the main pillars of our funds. Yeah, so if uh, we see from our backtesting records and our investment strategy that it makes sense, hence that's why we are brave enough to come up with that. We, 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 are, we are confident enough to come up with this kind of product for you uh, investors who actually uh, would like to have this uh, long-term view of the market, especially uh, in, on, in a stable kind of environment. Uh, if you go to page uh, next slide, uh, I'll be quick on this. I know it's, it's almost lunchtime. Yeah? Uh, uh, looking at the Mustarama uh, ESG fund, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about the key features here. Uh, I have mentioned earlier on our five pillars. Uh, next, please, if you don't mind. Uh, the investment objective for the fund is, of course, a medium to long term sustainable capital appreciation as uh, being an ESG and share compliant uh, portfolio. And as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the absolute uh, expected return of the fund is 6% per annum. So that's what we're targeting. Uh, hopefully, uh, with the given market conditions, uh, inshallah, we, we, we'll be able to, 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 to get there. Yeah? Uh, we have equal weighted, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they, that will be part of our strategy. However, our stock selection is our bread and butter. That's how we, uh, we, we aim to achieve this. And of course, the constituents of the uh, portfolio as, as a whole is, uh, is is being gone through a Shana screening and uh, it's in line with the ESG met methodology I mentioned in the uh, FTSE for Good Index and FTSE Rossmans. I think tomorrow there'll be a greater depth of uh, discussion about this. As for uh, the next slide, please. As for our fund management team, I think uh, just now we had a, a long session with Puan Aisha, uh, which was interesting, really deep uh, into the uh, ESG matter. Uh, she was uh, previously served uh, with Value Cap, and uh, she has 23 years experience in fund management industry and has managed a total of 23 billion in asset under management. So in terms of experience, she also is uh, in terms of experience, expertise, uh, uh, how she picks up the stocks. I think uh, we should, uh, she's already already have the experience, so it, sh it should be a concern. It couldn't, should be a concern actually. So uh, she was also instrumental in setting up the local and regional ESG fund uh, previously, and therefore uh, all the technical expertise in terms of where to invest and which stocks to pick. Uh, I mean, uh, she she already ha has it. Uh, together with the CIO, also uh, MDF Aman Asset Manager has a strong backing of fund managers. Uh, in total, more than hundred years uh, in terms of experience. I mean, you know, that's how old we are. And the portfolio as asset allocation uh, is stated in the prospectus is between 70 to 98%. So we have the ability to move. I mean, uh, according to IC, we need to, uh, to have some liquidity in order for uh, redemption or, asset or, or unit creation. Yeah. Uh, in the next slide, if you don't mind. Um, okay, uh, of course, when it comes to all unit trust funds, there is the element of risk. Uh, so however, uh, I will be discussing uh, only on the two specific risks uh, as compared to others. Uh, you look at the general risk. Uh, two specific risks is highlighted here is the uh, reclassification of st Sharia status. Yeah, because uh, once there's an evaluation of the Sharia status, it's done twice a year. 
uh, by the uh, by the regulators. We are always on alert if any incident occurs, and the portfolio will be updated if there's any changes. Yeah. So uh, no fear, because uh, of course there's some uh, purification processes that we have to go through. However, that is 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 the only risk that that we see, which is not related to the general market market risk, is the fund manager uh, who's managing it. Secondly, is the ESG investment risk, where the stock is taken up and inserted into the ESG basket, and it's usually done twice a year by uh, Bursa. See. Therefore, uh, we'll be on alert uh, given uh, given uh, the, the need for uh, you know our portfolio uh, rebalancing. I believe. Uh, next, next slide, please. I think uh, I believe we have arrived at the end of the slides again. I would like to thank Dr. Sharon, the panelists, and all participants. And I'm sure uh, all of you would have benefited from this content of the webinar. Please do not hesitate to email, call us for any queries. Our phone numbers are there. Yeah, uh, Email address, as stated in the slide. We'll be glad to assist and provide you with all the necessary information, documentation, such as prospectus, product highlight, account opening form. I believe uh, that's all for the day. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch and most importantly, stay safe. Wassalam. Thank, uh, thank now, you, Aslan. Yeah. Is there any more questions? That... Uh, yeah, there's uh, a question from the floor. Yeah. Is this ESG fund based on positive or negative st uh, screening of the constituents? It would be more of a positive screening of the constituents, actually. Yeah. Because yeah, that's that's what uh, that's what we have. Uh, so uh, when 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 we screen the the stocks, it will be looking at more uh, towards a, a, a what is already in the positive screening of the rather than we go and pick out uh, what whatever is negative in that sense. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, that's the end of the Q and A session. Are there any last words that you would like to say to the audience? Okay. Uh, come uh, please. Uh, Invest with us. Uh, we definitely have a, a very uh, interesting product, uh, which going forward uh, we will see, inshallah, uh, those kind of returns that I mentioned. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chazan. Thank you. Okay, before we wrap up, uh, just a reminder that tomorrow is the second day of our webinar. We will have a panel discussion on how to weight ESG levels of companies. Uh, and we would have another two corporate spotlight segments where we will be joined by representatives from Eco World Development Group Berhad and Inari Amatron Berhad, as well as a segment that will give insights into how we can contribute towards the ESG agenda. If you are interested, the timing for tomorrow's webinar is the same as today's, uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., and you may dial in by using the same link. With that, we have reached the end of today's webinar. Uh, on behalf of MIDF, I would like to express our appreciation for the speakers and panelists for joining us. And thank you to all the attendees for being here with us today. Uh, we hope uh, you will tune in for tomorrow's session. Take care and stay safe.